Hey, Boston. What's up? What up? How you doing? Good, man. You're looking Are different. You? Steve, this is Boston. Boston, Steve, my friend Steve. What's nice up, to meet man? you. What's up? Okay, Boston, I'm suspicious already. Your your face looks slightly bloated, and you have yeah. an unusual amount of beard hair under your mouth. You have no gaps. What is that? Okay, trend? okay. So <laughs> the reason I have no gaps is because Ariella dyed my beard today. Oh, okay, okay. So th- this used to be like blonde almost. So <laughs> that's why. And then my face is bloated is because I'm starting to put on weight now, like in a good like. I'm like I'm like you know what? All this cardio and shit to try to get lean. I'm just gonna start growing. Interesting. Oh. By the way, I used to dye my beard too. It's pretty interesting because when you first dye it, I used to dye my beard because mine was red. My half my beard is red, but you can't tell. When you dye it, the the skin gets dyed too, and then you look like super masculine with like a really dark. Right. You know what yeah, I mean? The stuff, the stuff was called the, it's on the commercial just for men. You've heard yeah, that's what I used to use. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that one. I used to have a beard, but I you know I had the same problem where it just didn't fill out, and then even dyeing it would make it look even worse. Did, really? Did you, ever, yeah. did you ever try minoxidil on the beard? No, I just let it grow, and then after a while, I was like, you know, this is too itchy for me. So that's I'm the just... stuff. That's the stuff that the guy sells on the forum that people uh, are in love with. They say it brings their hair back. Yeah, it does, and it can grow a beard mm. on an Asian guy. It can grow a wow. really thick beard on an Asian guy if you use like. And you do the derma rolling and all that stuff, and it's apparently it works a little bit. No? You don't even have to. Once I put it here, you know, I used to see these Afghani guys that had beards still here, Patan, in yeah. Dubai. And so I thought it was cool. You look like a pirate. So I was like, you know, I want to look up like a pirate too. So I put a little bit of minoxidil just here for three months. I swear my beard continued on till here. It was ridiculous. I had no face. It was just beard. So should I use that on my beard? You could easily grow a much thicker beard. It's very fun. I have, I'll, t- I'll I tell have you a source. Dude, I have like three bottles that are just sitting there because I don't have any hair issues. I'll try that. I'll do it. No, but you, you need the 10%, not the five. Okay, I, I don't know. Whatever this stuff is, people rave about it on the forum. Yeah, the forum is one. This worked. Yeah. All right, all right, guys. So I wanted to uh, first. Should we discuss? Okay, we have a couple of things to discuss before the Q and A's. First of all, uh, I wanted to ask Steve about Connor Murphy. So Boston, do you know Connor Murphy? Do you know who he is? Mm-mm. So I made a video this week about a guy called Connor Murphy, who apparently is a fitness slash pickup art celebrity on YouTube, who recently started using mushrooms, like you. But unlike you, he went off the deep end. And he's no longer seen. So I wanted to ask uh, Steve about what his impression was. Because I know, Steve, you originally thought that he might not, he might be acting. Yeah, I thought he might be acting just to get views or for attention. Because if if you're that far off the deep end, you're not going to be recording videos and editing them. And, and, you know, and he puts a significant amount of time into editing, you know, his Instagram and his YouTube videos. So I was like, you know what, maybe this is an act. You know, maybe his views are declining and this is a way to get his views up. Right? Mm-hmm. Social media is... Uh, a fun place for people to experiment a little bit to get more views. And then I saw that interview with uh, Kenny K.O. Mm. And I'm like, no, uh, this is all real. You yeah. can't fake that entire interview. I had to turn it off after five minutes because that was too, he, too much for me. You know, When he was trying to explain his rationale behind drinking the semen of that guy, right? I didn't even watch that. So he explained what that. What the fuck? <laughs> oh, bro, yeah. Boston. So this guy, like... <laughs> When he tripped out, he became like manic and he started to get obsessed with certain things. One of them is drinking semen. So he, because a lot of people, when they- His own semen? First. Another, now another, another guy. Another semen. <laughs> nah. So I'm not laughing at him, but like, anyway, so he, when he explained how he, why he was drinking it, he was so serious. He was like, this is like clear as day. There's nerve growth factor. I need the nerve growth factor. That's how I can get it. So he was like really rationalizing it. And at the same time, you could see he was uncomfortable in his own skin, right? He was not mm-hmm. relaxed and stuff like that. So I, have you ever seen these things? And this like, interview is currently up on Kenny KO's channel? Yeah, on KO Podcast. Yeah, yeah you, you, I'll send you some stuff after. <laughs> yeah, you, don't, you don't know it's, about it. Uh, it's like, troubling to see, you know, because I, I'm from Holland and I've seen plenty of guys dabble with the recreational drugs and I've tried my fair share, but I never went off that far or seen anybody else that went off that far. You know, I've seen addiction and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, you know, Leo's been exposed to that as well, the people that got addicted, but they never go manic or something like that. So I feel like he's completely broken internally. And you yeah. could tell in the video. Oh, bro, oh. I'll send you some videos. It'd make you, it'll make you like feel sad inside. He would, wow. he would play the Joker in, in, yeah. you know, some sort of X-rated Batman movie, 100% or Riddler, you know? Oh, oh yeah, like, the Riddler. A legitimate. This, this kid actually had a decent following before he did all this, or what? Two million. Million. Two million. 
Wow. Yeah, that's right. And now, but the mm-hmm. thing is, now he posted a video declaring that he's a pedophile, and that video he's basically harming himself. So that oh, in really? California, you could fifty to fifty him. You know what that is, Boston, right? In wow. California, if people do something like to harm themselves, you can call the state and they'll take them to like a mental hospital. And then in four days, they get a court appointment. They call but, that like the something act, right? The something yeah, act. yeah, that, uh, that act thing. I forgot what it's called. But Because can- Kenny KL reached out and he seemed legitimately concerned. And he, he's usually overcritical because, you know, he does reaction uh, channel kind of videos. But he said legitimately concerned because they met in real life a couple of times and discussed a couple of videos on YouTube together. But I mean, you see, even see Kenny Ko just cringing, you know, at everything this guy was saying. So it's it's yeah, it's very alarming to see. But it, it I mean, it's not unheard of that this happens, but it doesn't happen on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, here in Thailand, we got crazy people walking down the street, also outside of Bangkok, and they're, Does they're butt naked. Still have his channel? Yeah. Hey, Kenny? No, the the, the Connor Murphy guy. Does he still yeah. have his channel? Yeah, he does. I think that's his only revenue stream at the moment. Um, oh, he's you know, Joe Boston. He also gave away his money. Like he gave people, like he gave people clues to use his credit cards, and like what? he put his credit card numbers, the back, everything online. Yeah. So it was very intense. Yeah. So this, this guy needs to lost it. Yeah. yeah, it needs to be institutionalized, and I don't think there's any way supplement or whatever that we we can prescribe the guy. Just guy, you need medical attention. Yeah, yeah it's Literally. called uh, Leo. It's called the Baker Act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is what it's called. <laughs> All right. There's there's a question, by the way. Well, before we continue, there's a question by Signoretti, which was about uh, Thailand. He said, um, a follow up question to the one I gave on the podcast with Tony. Would Boston still consider moving to Thailand with Ariella and Jackson? And what's Steve's opinion on the bodybuilding life in Bangkok, affordability, etc.? But I'd also like Steve to tell us about Thai woman, his opinion on Thai woman. What do you- yeah. uh, I'll let Boston take it first. So yeah, for yes. sure, I would never move there now. There's no way. With a kid and wife, no way. I, I do not want to go down there. Fuck that. <laughs> it's a great place to live. Um, really, for bodybuilding, it's a great place to live. Um, yeah, but but it's, uh, would you say the same for somebody who's married with a kid, though? I'm married, but I'm married to a Thai. So Are you in yeah, Thailand? I'm, yeah, I'm in Thailand right now. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah Tony is uh, right around the corner here. Uh, Tony Huge is right around the corner. In, How long uh, ago have you been out there for? 15 years. You've been living in Thailand for 15 years? <laughs> oh. I didn't know it was 15 years. <laughs> yeah, wow. since 2006. So the first time I came here, a, a friend of mine invited me. And then I realized, you know what? This country, I can do everything I want, you know, in moderation. And in Holland, you can do a lot of things. But in, in Thailand, you can literally do everything you want, as long as you don't hurt anybody in the process, right? And that's <laughs> really not in my interest. So I can just live a completely free life and, and live my bodybuilding, you know, completely carefree without judgment outside or you know you get a little bit of social anxiety because people stare at you because you're you know gigantic compared to the average people here but people generally leave you alone and there's so there's no like in holland you would walk around and you would get these weird you know steroid questions right or how much do you bench none of that here oh. it's very it's a lot of freedom you know and, and and there's a very good expat community that you can talk with they're all uh, you know self self-made and, and businessmen that that are all kind of, you know, slipping through the cracks and, and finding their way through life. And that's why it's fun to be here because there's a lot of like-minded people here. Have you ever lived in the U.S. though? No, I've never been to the U.S. And every time I wanted to go, there's something going on that, you know, uh, prevents me from going like uh, some sort of virus. Wow. So you never even been here. Okay. So that's a little no. different. Okay. Yeah. We have to so get I can't really this. compare Like I, I would think about move, going to Las Vegas for one time and see how it compares. Like I like Dubai. I've been there three times now. But I, I've never been to Vegas or the States and just see how the people are differently and how would life would be in Vegas. You know, something like it's like 24 seven and doesn't stop just like Bangkok. Vegas is not it's like it, when you live abroad, you feel like Vegas is going to be like Dubai or something. Mm-hmm. Dude, Vegas is a street. It's tiny. It's there's nothing. It's one street with a bunch of casinos on it. And that's mm-hmm. it. After you leave that street, there's nothing there in that whole state. You're talking, about, like, you're talking about Vegas? Yeah, there's, it's just a street. Dude, I've been there once. I couldn't stand that place. It's so like the, it's such a bad environment. Like people on the street, like you feel like the tra- it's city. It's literally city yes. city for a reason, dude. It's like Bahrain. It's- if you've ever been to Bahrain, have you been to Bahrain? No. It's sort of like Bahrain, like a lot of drunk people on the street, all kinds of weird things happen on the street. And it's like one area. It's very small. 
I it's thought not Bahrain is an Arab country, right? It, isn't that like frowned upon? It's, or, this, this it's is... the Saudi Las Vegas. Oh, really? They go it's over kinda... there to drink, yeah, on the weekends. Anyway, so uh, I Must wanted to ask you place. both Boston and Steve because, oh, before we do that, no, tell us about Thai women also, though. You so, heard so, our, our you, depiction yeah, on the last one, right? So you see, uh, t- t- Tony, you, you go to all the podcasts, right? Mark Bell podcast, and then here and talks about Thai women, like they're the most easy and, uh, you know, obedient women on the planet. But uh, Tony surrounds himself with a particular kind of Thai women. And I got a couple messages after the last podcast and I'm like, yeah, I need to rectify something because Thai women are nothing like, like what Tony described them to be, you know? So like they're basically the same as everywhere else, you know, self-respecting women that like to work and, and, you know, appreciate a family life. But you know, the, the women that Tony surrounds himself with are in patio, which is an entertainment area. Mm. And most of those girls are not there to party and have fun with foreigners. They're there to pay debt that their family often got into, yeah, they're forced into it. Wow. And then they get a little bit into that life and they start drinking a little bit and they make a little bit of money. So now they get their own financial security and freedom. And then they start to enjoy it a little bit, but the act of how they make money, I doubt any of them enjoy it. Fascinating. Yeah. And negotiating with guys about prices, uh, you know, to get laid and yeah. We got, we got, I got some comments from people living in Thailand on that episode also saying Mm. like that, Thai women are, you know, like they're, well, the comments I got were that they were harsher than he depicted and they're like tough people and like oh, yeah. straightforward and, you know, a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So but like it, my wife is freaking hardcore, you know, she doesn't take anything and she's it's very orientated on business. And it's one of probably the only woman that I ever met in my life that would I, I would consider my equal when it comes to business and drive and, and that kind of stuff. And I was not able to find such a woman in any of the other countries that I've been to. And I've been... I've been all around except for the States, Mm. but it's, yeah. So, so when people see that, they think, oh yeah, Thailand sounds like a fun place, but it's Thailand, like any other country has a huge manual. And if you, if you come here thinking that Thai women are easy, um, or, or, you know, (laughs) yeah, some of them are, but the majority, if you want, you know, a solid woman in a good relationship, like we're all married, you're Boston, you're married also, right? Yeah. 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 So if you want a solid woman that you can marry, uh yeah as a foreigner it will take you a long time to find one really huh yeah is, because is the solid Thai woman solid Thai women they don't marry foreigners they marry mm-hmm. other solid Thai guys They're that's the comment i got the that's foreigner. the comment i got they said that the yeah. women that, that will marry foreigners usually they won't be the standard woman like there's a prejudice against foreigners to some degree right and they have like the preference same as the the the, the blonde girls that like the black guys in the western world right and then <laughs> i come to thailand and i'm the black guy Basically, <laughs> really Oh, and it's not for the penis length or anything like that, uh, even though it does help, obviously. Uh, but, you know, That's like true. when you're a foreigner, you're always a little bit, there's a little bit of a stigma, right? And yeah. and the foreigners that come to Thailand, they're, they're stigmatized as well, just like as the Thai women are stigmatized. And both, they work very, very well together, but it's only a small portion, mm-hmm. you know? So the guys that end up in Padia and, and, and you know, party their days away and, and surround themselves with the women that party their days away as well until they get some rich foreigner that takes them away from the party scene. Mm. Right. But you can't take the bar out of the girl. So be worried, guys. <laughs> what, what, city, what city are you in? Are you, are you in the same city as Tony? Bangkok. Yeah. I live in Bangkok. How far is, is that, that from him? Two hours by taxi. Oh, that's far. Okay. So you guys are far. Okay. No, that's close. Tony's Two hours by the, taxi. Yeah. Tony's in like a, it's more like a resort area or party area. Yeah, let's, that? let's say, uh, you know, Las Vegas, right? So you call that Sin City. Mm. So Patty is like Sin City times a thousand. Oh, okay. This is interesting. We need to go. This there. is, this is like the party town of Asia, you know? Hey, talking about trips, I want to mention something to the listeners. We know we have a lot of listeners from Australia, and some of them have been asking Boston to come visit Australia with with me. And I want to visit Australia with Boston. I'm going to continue uh, bullying him or pressuring him into it, hopefully slowly. (laughs) Not bullying him, but pressuring him into it slowly as he gets better, as health gets better. you got to get me a passport first. (laughs) You don't have a passport? No, I've never been been anywhere. Oh. So... So Boston, tell me what happened in the Indie Pro. I don't know what's what's going on. What are the updates? Well, the Indie Pro was we were very weird with the way they judged it. I had the the guy who won and the second place guy where they should have been, and then everything else was scattered. But that blessing guy really shit the bed, man. He yeah. really. He was, but he was very fit, right? But he was small. Yeah, his legs were were downsized. They didn't have the cuts they should have had. He was either flat or something happened, man. Because he, I mean, his legs were gone. He looked nervous. 
on did stage. You, you, and I think I think he psyched himself out backstage. Did, didn't it look like his legs just like lost like everything? Like like there was like no cuts in him either. It was weird. Yeah, I, I think he went backstage and then he saw Morgan Ashed, how how big and full and round and hard and shredded he was. And then he, he psyched himself. He's like, oh, and then they spill. And I've seen it happen stress, so many times backstage. Yeah. So that's what he looked like. It is a self-sabotage backstage. Morgan is huge. By the way, Morgan is such a weird French name. I called my wife and I was like, this guy's French. And his name is Morgan. Wait, wait, by the way, I got to comment on something. Morgana. I got to comment on something. So Boston, check this out. <laughs> so I, I hear that Morgan Asti is this giant, right? So then I see an interview at Ron Harris interview on MD. So I call my wife and I'm like, look, there's a French giant here. So she sits down and she's like, what's his name? And I'm like, Morgan. She's like, that's not, it sounds like an Irish name. I'm like, yeah, that's true. While I'm looking, I notice that um, that guy from Ron Harris is almost the same height as Morgan Asti. Two inches apart. So I'm like, wait a minute. I know Ron Harris is 5'8". So either this guy is not 6'6". Or Ron no, Harris is wearing. <laughs> he's Morgan Ass is six three three hundred on stage. But but he was so close in height to Ron Harris that Ron Harris is either wearing something, bro, which Ron they do Harris, sometimes. I caught Dave never, doing that before. <laughs> I think Ron Harris is wearing some platforms because yeah. I, I've seen pictures with Morgan Ass and Joe Stedix, a friend of mine who also lives in Thailand, yeah. and and you know there's a clear discrepancy. You know, it's like half a foot difference because yeah, exactly. Joe's about my height, five nine. Yeah. So, yeah. so Morgan was extremely in extremely good condition, huh? Did the you guys? Feel, show. Yeah. Did you feel like he deserved a higher placing? Yeah. So he had the best side shot in the show. He yeah. had the best back double bicep in the show. Yeah. Um, I, I don't. I think they fucked him hard, giving him six. Man, they they had this really short, like Hispanic guy named Camilo. I think placing fifth in in front of him that was bad. I don't understand mm. that at all. What did you yeah, think was, of he, Dorian? Oh, dude, he's such a bloated monster. Like, his gut, he couldn't control his midsection. He was sweating like a pig on stage. He he was moving erratically, but that guy has a lot of muscle, huh? A lot mm. of muscle, but structurally, and his legs are not there. where they, they kind of flatten out. That's true. For instance, he has amazing from the side and shit. He looks sick. Who else was so there sick. in the top three? Oh, I wanted to say about Justin. Justin also has... Like uh, diff- uh, he has an amazing body. I, I have no critique against him. I just wanted to comment that his abs, like when he poses, sometimes you don't see any abs, which is interesting. Like sometimes bodybuilders, when their abs start splitting, a lot of growth hormone stuff, you start to not see any abs. What is that? And, and how yeah, do I think they also don't train. Abs? They also don't train it so much anymore. Why? I think that's very very small. common. Just to keep it small, yeah, because some guys get horrible obliques, you know, if they start training them heavy. So what I do, and many of my clients do, is just high reps. Right, but they're not on these dosages that the pros are on, uh, or suspecting that they're on. So you know, maybe their abs are not idea. popping I that think much. It's a bad idea, and it backfires when a lot of guys don't train their abs. Uh, mm-hmm. I know a few in general where they don't even have the ab development, and it's almost like you would rather have a little bit of a wider waist to actually have some development in your midsection. Some of these guys have no abs. It's really bizarre. Exactly. Boston, do you, do you know, like here in Asia, it's a little bit popular to put Botox in your obliques. Oh my God. I never heard of that. No. Okay. Yeah. Does that so work? That the, yeah. Oh, really? Fast. Shrinks them, shrinks them very well. And then you, you think Botox that's what, in your obliques. That, you, so that's what I'm suspecting sometimes where they don't have any stomach control anymore because they put a little bit of Botox on the side. So just to, to shrink the, and I even thought about it because I have horrible obliques, you know, years of uh, heavy rowing. Mm-hmm. So you put a little bit in obliques and it would shrink it in if you, you know, do the, the waist trainer 24 seven, right? But you also lose a little bit of stomach control because you're, you're always, always relaxing your stomach against the waist trainer. And then on stage, you don't have this good control that, you know, that you get my wife had the same thing when she wore a waist trainer, but she didn't do Botox in the obliques. Mm. But I've heard several guys that put, you know, Botox in their jaw also because they, you know, they do the chicken broccoli uh, diet oh. and then, you know, boiled chicken, right? And you get this horrible, <laughs> horrible jaw pump when you're on a fuck ton of androgens. So they would put Botox in the uh, jaw and Botox in the obliques and it would just... Do you think that's what Rolly did? Because that weird thing when his his waist just shrank so much, he's the only guy that's ever done that. His waist did come down a lot. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Now, Boston, what do you think of the New York Pro that's upcoming? That's the big one, I think. I'm excited for that show, man. I think Justin. Mm-hmm. I think Justin will beat Nick. I mm-hmm. think Nick will probably be second, and then and then I think Hassan will be third, and then I, I think Blessing will probably be out of the top five. Yeah, I think I, so. Hassan is. I think Hassan. I think he might be second if he nails it this time because he's never yeah, he really nailed it. Peeled. He has to be yeah. peeled. 
Hassan I mean, is so unbelievable. pumped up, man. He looks yeah, so I, that's pumped his up. side shots. It's like, can you have more muscle? I don't know if it's possible. Yeah. It's unbelievable. That Egyptian genetics, huh? There's so many of them. There was that Egyptian who was competing, Mohammed something, in the last show from Saudi Arabia. He was he was okay too. Right. And then the other guy uh, that used to compete, uh, well, Mohammed, uh, probably called Mohammed also. Yeah, uh, he used to train in the, in the 90s. And then he, he used to train with Milos. What was his name? Mohammed Makawi? No, the, another one. Another but Muhammad. You, I'll tell you an interesting fact. Did you know that in Bangladesh, all men are called Muhammad? Almost all men. 99% of them. Yeah, it's a very common name. And, and then and there's Ali. No, but literally, no, no, no. There's no Ali. They're all called Muhammad. And then there's they have like a second name. And you call the guy by his second name. But his first oh, name is Muhammad. So it's like MD. And they call it MD. And then his second, his actual name. A lot of doctors there. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was hearing from a client of mine who was a doctor, doctoral student. No, they they started using MDs. <laughs> it's very, very common names in the world, you know. That's yeah. true. Okay, so so uh, do you think Nick Walker is gonna is gonna do that well? Can he beat uh, the Egyptian guy? Who uh, can he beat Justin? Yeah, I don't think he can beat Justin. I really don't. I think structurally, Justin so so uh, so oh, ahead of him. Yeah, and the muscle like, maturity is, is well, yeah quite far ahead. But again, you know, Nick has only done one pro show and he got fourth. So I, I don't, I would expect him to jump over, you know, a couple spots and end up in the second place. But again, if, if uh, you know, Hassan Mohammed is uh, in shape, then Mustafa, he'll probably Hassan be second. Mustafa. Isn't he Hassan, Hassan Mustafa? Hassan Mustafa? I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm, I'm We're sorry. both sorry, Hassan. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, think, you, think, you think he's going to be peeled? Hassan? That's, they, they just posted some recent photos of him posing with Flex Wheeler. He doesn't look like he's going to be in, sh in, in contest shape. He looks no. very full, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, his legs didn't separate or anything. Yeah. And he would benefit from a couple of weeks off from growth hormone. Yeah, just to let everything suck in a little bit. And maybe maybe some uh, albumin uh, IV the night before. Wouldn't you want to give somebody like that, like get him off test completely like they used to back in the day for the whole week? Because that guy's holding water. Like somebody yeah, like him. A guy like that's that big, I think they would benefit from doing that. Yeah. I agree 100% from a guy that's that big. But if you don't have that crazy muscle and fullness, then I, I wouldn't risk pulling the test out. No, because this guy's problem is he's got so much muscle, but it's just the definition, right? So yeah, him or Rob needs to shrink everything in a little bit. Yeah, get the extracellular fluid pull the, out and then. Pull the uh, test, maybe. Pull the growth hormone and then have like him run like a really high dose of Primo, Mastron, and, and Winstrol. Right. You know, get that estrogen down and get the water retention from the GH off. And then it's a two-week process. You know? I mean, shit, even if he lost, you know, five pounds of tissue, I mean, he would still be insane. Right. It's, incredible. it's really incredible. All right, guys, we have wonderful questions this week. We begin with Coach Khan, who says he wants to know Steve and Boston's approach to potassium and iodine for coaching athletes with nutrition. What do they implement or apply supplement slash food wise for potassium and iodine? He's asking because he thinks this is often neglect neglected. Actually, Steve is obsessed with potassium. So maybe we should begin there. <laughs> I'm obsessed not obsessed, but, it, but it, I, I see so many benefits, you know, when you increase your potassium intake a little bit uh, and whether that comes from vegetables vegetables are using like a hard salt, which in many cases is like sodium chloride and potassium chloride. And then if you find a good hard salt, it also has like 45 micrograms of iodine. Mm. Um, so you get everything and you just salt all your meals that way. You get some extra potassium and add some extra iodine with each meal. And then what I do with most of my clients is just mix the Himalaya pink salt with the hard salt that's iodized. And then you use one or two grams per meal. So you get extra sodium, a little bit of extra potassium, maybe 100, 150 milligrams per meal on top of what you get from your protein sources and your uh, vegetable sources and that kind of stuff. And then you see that the potassium intake is, you know, quite significantly elevated at the end of the day, maybe 8,000, 10,000 milligrams per day, and then three, 4,000 milligrams of sodium. And that, that works quite well to stay full and keep the electrolyte balance going and keep the blood pressure down. But I noticed that after adding in the telmersartan, uh, which is the ARB, right? that I, I started getting uh, hypokalemia. Yeah. So so I had to discontinue the potassium salt and I asked a couple of my clients and some of them experienced something similar, but they they were not, uh, they're not as in tune with their body as I am. Mm -hmm. um, you know, otherwise they wouldn't need a coach, obviously. Yeah. Um, and so some guys are still running the potassium salt, but they're not eating so much vegetables. And I had to discontinue it and I took it out of some of my clients' program as well. And they started to lean out, which is counterintuitive. You would think you would get more watery mm -hmm. from uh, lowering the potassium or, or having a little bit different potassium to sodium balance. 
And so I'm, I'm not really sure what the mechanic is behind the telmersartan and the hyperkalemia. So but if you're not running telmersartan, then it's, you know, I feel it's beneficial, you know, and you still got to manage your magnesium and calcium. Otherwise it's, you're still creating an electrolyte imbalance. What do you think, Boston? Well, they say some people on ACE inhibitors and, and ARBs, some people will, their potassium levels will, will come high. Now, Steve, did you actually feel any side effects from your potassium being high or you just knew because of your blood work? My, no, no, so I, unfortunately I didn't check that with blood work because I discontinued the potassium way before I went in for blood work two weeks ago or one and a half weeks ago. So I noticed that I got edema mm. and my micro cramps. Oh, really? So I was like, yeah, like that twitchy in your calves, you know, at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, this is not good. So I, I stopped the heart salt and I con contacted a couple of clients who are in comparable protocols, you know, with ARBs and potassium salt and all that kind of stuff. And they, they said the same effect. So I said, okay, get off the hard salt and just do Himalaya pink salt and switch to an iodine supplement. But then again, most guys are in T4, so you don't need iodine supplementation because iodine already has four iodine uh, atoms inside. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, what, I mean, what you, are you microdosing, Leo? Uh, no, this was, uh, no, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no, because because that's funny because today I was watching an arm wrestling show and the guy literally mm. took a piece of powder and put it in his mouth like Nick did on my show. I was like, holy shit, people doing drugs on podcasts all the time. No, I don't. I use wow. snus. It's a Swedish kind of tobacco. But okay. but I wanted to talk to you guys about this. So I don't supplement with potassium because I use an ARV. And all of my mm -hmm. clients who use steroids use ARBs, so they don't supplement with potassium. I don't supplement with iodine because supplementing with iodine has been shown to increase the rates of uh, likelihood of developing thyroid cancers by about 15% in the world population since they began mm -hmm. adding iodized salt. So instead of adding iodized salt, I think that the goal should be to look at someone's, especially if someone's using steroids or growth hormone, there becomes the risk that the TSH could start becoming high. So I'd right. rather just look at the TSH and deal with it with levothyroxine than to yeah, start supplementing thyroid and potentially start growing the thyroid. It's honestly, Dave, that scared me about this. And I've been trying to think about how to protect oneself from the thyroid cancers, you know? Yeah. Guess who loves potassium too? Ooh. Amin. <laughs> yeah, right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> likes all the potassium the and then Lasix. <laughs> No, no. Lasix potassium, Lasix potassium, yeah, Lasix yeah. potassium. <laughs> it does work. It yeah, does work. But he, he, fucked himself, <laughs> he fucked himself up on it his last show. I had to troll his ass. He was like, he was making posts saying, oh, I'm going to eat all this spaghetti and junk food, but don't worry. I'm using potassium and, and Lasix. I'm going to be shredded. And he literally went on stage, spilled like a fucking, like he fucking loaded on milk. But, there, but there's not so much muscle there to spill on, right? It's an there's interesting no situation. Yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting situation, actually. I mean, yeah. it's funny. I mean, he doesn't have enough muscle to even carve up. To be honest with you, he shouldn't be carving up. <laughs> can I can I pull the card that my wife was more muscular? No, I shouldn't. Right? I shouldn't. <laughs> hey. My wife competed a lot to uh, Boston, so you know, I, I went through the ringer with her to go to all the world championships. Were you, were you, a pretty, were you pretty big at one time? I used to be. Yeah. Never competed. I, do you want to see the pictures I have on my phone? It's, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I, did, well, I saw some pictures when you were bigger. So what made yeah. you lose all the muscle? So I, I was diagnosed with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And even though I didn't, you know, against uh, Leo's recommendation, uh, I have to highlight that. Yeah. Uh, in, in hindsight, he was right. So I, against Leo's recommendation, I went off cycle and did post-cycle therapy and resolved the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And now we're... Uh, now I'm at 95 kilos instead of 100 shredded. And it's not a pretty 95. <laughs> so you're off everything? Uh, well, never never say everything, right? But I'm off the anabolic androgenic steroids. Like no, no TRT? No nothing? No. No, I, I, I post-cycle therapy. And then actually now my testosterone is 630 nanograms per deciliter. Oh, that's good. You're awesome. Yeah. It's, it's surprising. And, and Leo said something about testicular uh, sclerosis, right? So I went for an ultrasound mm. on my testicles. Mm. Nothing there. I went for an ultrasound and all my scar tissue, like in the glutes and the, in the lats and the upper uh, uh, quads, right? Nothing there, no necrotic tissue, no nothing. Oh, yeah, I didn't post it because it's so uneventful, right? Mm. I mean, it, it would just look like a flex. I injected steroids for 20 years and I have no necrotic tissue or scar tissue, yeah. you know, on my ultrasound, which it's, it's a terrible way to detect it anyway. But or maybe, maybe the Thai ultrasounds are not that great. <laughs> let's just, let's just yeah. potentially. No, no, so this is the same equipment. They, so I go to some sort of private clinic, right? A small budget private clinic because the turnover is way faster. You don't need to go through a doctor to get everything prescribed and then they pad the bill with another two or three hundred dollars right mm -hmm. so i got this little clinic but they use the exact same measuring equipment 
that I uh, that they use at the private hospitals that are ten times the price. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're and then nowadays during COVID, they they see a hypochondriac like me, and then they start padding the bill. Mm-hmm. Exactly. How much so is like, medical out there? Is it is it cheap? Cheap. Like cheap. Even, like fMRIs and, and CTs. Don't have insurance. Yeah, you don't need insurance. I'm also insurance. would be there with no insurance, so happy. He loves not having insurance. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Right. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I can live out there with no insurance. Yeah, as long as you got money in the bank. How much is that? Di- I wonder how much they charge you for dialysis and shit. I can check. It shouldn't be too expensive. It's another reason to move here, or or, or you know, pre- you know, try to prevent dialysis. Uh, maybe dialysis. I can find a donor. <laughs> Leo, maybe I could find a donor in Thailand. <laughs> you, I, def, I bet you can. And if you can't, I bet we can find some, someone somewhere else. We really need yeah, to go so on a mission. This is the that. misconception of Thailand. It's it's not a place like that where you just, some random guy in the street, I say, how's your blood work? Well, what if you, what if you walk, can I buy your kidney? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work like that. But know? what if you walk across to Cambodia? Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Right around there, you can find some kidneys, I bet. Oh, and I'm going to get messages from Cambodian people. <laughs> I mean, Cambodia doesn't work like that, you know? <laughs> Listen, everybody has a price, including in the Western I world. heard Cambodia um, is, like, dangerous to visit. I heard, like, you can get fucking, like, kidnapped and shit. So, so that's all over the world, right? If you associate yourself with, like, shitty, shady people, uh, then you can get into trouble. And... But Thailand and Cambodia, I've been to Cambodia and Laos and Vietnam, and they're, they're amazing people. They're wonderful. But if you go into the deep end and you start doing like what Connor is doing in Thailand, mm. yeah, you get a lot of insane friends that are just as fucked up as you are. And then, yeah, it won't last long, you know, or Colombia, for example. If you associate yourself with the wrong kind of people, then, then yeah, bad things are going to happen. But if you associate yourself with good people and know how to, recognize the troublemaker then you're you keep him with arm's length then you're fine mm. you know yeah. i think in, in some countries though it's so dangerous that you could end up in trouble without intending like mexico or brazil you could yeah, potentially get maybe. kidnapped I if they realize there. that you're rich or something you know same, same as in philippines right where some islands are completely off limits because they're cooking methamphetamines there and you yeah. don't know you charter a boat say, oh, let's go to this island it's uninhabited and then you're <laughs> you don't come back <laughs> okay, so we have a question by the juicy one. He says, uh, recently watched an interview with Palumbo about being a mass monster. And within this, he talked about utilizing sp- a spike in cortisol to form his sleep schedule to decrease muscle wasting. He said, because the increase in cortisol being in the morning, he'd go to sleep around 4 a.m. and wake up around 12 p.m. Uh, this is obviously going to have neg- negligible effects, but I'd like to know your opinion on this. So basically, I'm sure both of you heard this before. Palumbo used to say, I think he's joking when he says this, but he says that, you know, cortisol spikes in the morning. So he used to sleep in late to miss the cortisol spike. I'm not sure if he's joking, but I, what do you think of this, Steve? I think that you're missing with your circadian rhythm. and You get that cortisol spike later in the day with a vengeance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the cortisol. So you wake up, guys. You're woken up from sleep by two hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. You're not mm-hmm. waking up if it's not cortisol and adrenaline. So whenever the hell you wake up, it's gonna hit you then. It's exactly. not about a time of the day that. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. I've heard him say that multiple times about that shit too. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dave also said that T4 doesn't work. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting things. That's so not I- true. He told me to take T4. It's not on one of his ass days. I oh, don't I, think no, T4 I'm not it doesn't work. Wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong, yeah. but what I'm saying is Dave says a lot of stuff like that. But then right. uh, behind closed doors, he'll like be like, oh, you know, like, for instance, he, uh, you know, he likes to comment. Like if you're hypothyroidism, he, he likes T4. Mm. Oh, yeah, maybe in certain situations. Like for, it's, for, it's, for bodybuilders, like mm-hmm. that he's prepping for shows, he never uses T4. It's just high doses of T3. But if somebody was to show him blood work and they're hypo, he would tell them to get on T4. Okay, that makes sense. Mm, okay. So, so IK, IKC asks, he says, this question might ruffle some feathers, but given his suspicious progress as a teenager, do you think Chris Bumstead's kidney issues are not actually from an autoimmune disorder, which he remarkably, if he, which he is remarkably evasive in describing, but from abusing androgens from 15 to 16 onwards? I think he's telling the truth. Yeah, I think I think it was natural in that picture also where it was 18. I mean, I've seen There's those no genetic outliers. There's no way that kid's abusing drugs. Mm. No. He's just a very he gifted person, huh? Yeah, and I've seen those genetic outliers myself around me. You go to the gym, you sign up, and then a buddy is like ripping the 100-pound the uh, play uh, oh, dumbbells yeah. in a month, you know? And you're like, um, why is why is that I just did happening that. to me? I just did that. <laughs> yeah? But I have a muscle memory, obviously. Look at right. his sister, man. His sister's a... T- t- uh, Top ten figure Olympian. I mean, it, right. it, 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 yeah. 
She's top 10. Wow. Yeah, she's yeah awesome. his sister was a great athlete too. That's a whole family of athletes, you know, yeah. Ian and, and Chris and, uh, you know. So, so I want to sh- shed some light on this. Maybe it'll it'll make the person who's asking the question less suspicious. The mm. kidneys are extremely affected. In Boston, this is important for you also. The kidneys are extremely affected by sympathetic nervous drive. So the more stressed out, the more you, your nervous system, when it becomes fight or flight, it goes to sympathetic. When it does that, mm. the kidneys start becoming, they damage themselves. One of the things they most study in chronic kidney disease is sympathetic innervation to the kidney. For example, SGLT2 inhibitors like empagliflozin reduce sympathetic innervation to the kidney, thereby increasing erythropoiesis, improving your red blood cell count because they reduce the nervous connection to the kidney. They lower the heart rate in the same way. So, so when you take steroids, you increase the nervous connection in the kidneys, if, if it's trend or something, because you're in that nervous state all the time. All right. That and would, the blood and when pressure. You're in that, huh? And the blood pressure uh, increases blood on pressure top. Pressure. It makes it yeah. even worse, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think for him, I mean, it's it's probably an autoimmune disease that is, is exacerbated with the bodybuilding lifestyle. And again, you know, not everybody has access to pharmaceutical grade compounds and, and during contest prep you're running underground labs regardless if you're running a little bit of train or whatever and maybe it's you got inflammation from the the carrier oils as well i mean i mentioned it a million times before and so i'll mention it again you know some of the carrier oils cause inflammation and exacerbate pre-existing medical conditions like an autoimmune disease or maybe inflammation in the kidneys themselves and i tell you, know, you making what, I the, those pre-workout those pre, the, my health started going downhill you yeah, obviously the fttp did me in but my health started really going downhill when I started using compounds with a lot of PIP, like um, like injectable Anadrol, injectable D-ball, uh, yeah. injectable TNE, like any of the drugs that crash where you have well, to heat that, them up. That injectable that's all the glycol Anadrol. stuff, right? All the glycol. Yeah, yeah. The, the stuff that's yeah. mixed in the goo call, the stuff that smells like shit. Yeah. So yeah. that stuff crashes very easily. So, mm. you know, a good amount of time, these drugs have to be shot every day or every other day. And I was doing that and I had to heat these drugs up constantly because they kept crashing. I really think, because I'll tell you what, before I'd be able to handle them, now if I took a shot of something that was crashed or that I had to heat up, the next day I'm, I am feel sick, nauseous. You feel sick, right. Yeah, so, I feel so, sick, nauseous. So people on the, on the message boards, they will always describe that as test flu, right? You feel a little bit lethargic and a little bit sickly and after yeah. injection, oh, you'll get used to it. And you do get used to it because you get used to the feeling of feeling like shit. But it's the oil. And a lot of people get adverse reactions. So the glycol and the propylene glycol and the mycleol in some cases. I used to be and able to tolerate it, but never, not anymore, you know? No. So the, with prolonged exposure, it gets worse and worse and worse. And I, I used underground labs a couple of years ago, and then I got systemic inflammation to the point I couldn't even walk downstairs. My knees would just be inflamed chronically. And I would take all the supplements to get that resolved and spend thousands of dollars on TB500 and BP57. But it wasn't until I switched to 100% pharmaceutical that actually all this systemic inflammation went away. And I always ask people for blood work, right? So I saw every time the high sensitivity C-reactive protein levels would be sky high. And then I made a connection and said, it's the fucking oil. Because these guys, the, the C-reactive protein is low when they're cruising on the same products. And then it's sky high when, when they go on cycle for a contest prep, right? And then I started switching everybody to pharmaceutical grade, but it's not commonly accepted yet. People know about test flu and that ethyl oleate might give some adverse reaction. And besides that, it's not common knowledge yet. So all those sources that use glycol, propylene glycol, mycleol, or anything else that's basically a solvent, and not a carrier oil, it's a solvent, it's like refined bin or, you know, hyper special benzyl benzoate. I mean, it's because if you, if you just interrupt for a second, just think about mm-hmm. the idea of a solvent. A solvent has to be chemically active at dissolving things. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the point, right? That's what it's doing on the inside. And you're bypassing your natural immune response and your ability to break the stuff down through the stomach and you're injecting it. And now you got all the solvent in your muscle. So you see that creatine phosphate kinase is sky high because you start dissolving the, the muscle around the injection site. And then your liver enzymes go high and then your C-reactive protein goes high. And you let that go for a couple of years and then you have, uh, you know, arteriosclerosis or, or you know, heart disease or, or you know, let, kidney let's issues. Add a, let's add a caveat though for, for uh, Chris, Chris Bumstead specifically, because mm-hmm. I know his coach, Ian. Ian has... Mm-hmm checks his C-reactive protein and his C-reactive protein is infinitesimal. So I'm yeah. sure he's on track with Ian and they're watching. I'm sure. Just, just, I'm to, sure. just to mention that. And also, Boston, that MK that I have, that I use, it is filled with solvents, bro. That thing, I can barely oh, drink it. It's a dropper, right? 
Yeah, I don't want you to say that, but yeah. <laughs> Someone has to cut this. But anyway, yeah, the, the one that that one is filled with solvents, bro. I that do yeah, not take it. That. That's that's how they dissolve it. Don't take that one. It's too strong. The solvents on that one. That one's like I love that one. That's my dude. That, I that like one, it, but it's. it's I don't know our, how you drink that it. Was best, that was our best seller, man. How do you drink it? Do you what? I mean, I can tolerate anything, man. But after that, I'm drinking like Seven Up water. I've trying to, tried, I've tried like seven different companies. They all taste like shit, like that. Oh, do they really? So, so, oh, they so all I, taste like shit. I just made a conscious decision and said, okay, I'm not going to touch this stuff anymore. I'm okay. No, no, nothing no, no, in solvents. But, whatever, but, but, whatever. That's the oral or the injectable. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah of course. I mean, if it's definitely a consideration. I mean, basically, no, I had. I mean, no, I had. I had basically yeah. the same result. You know, a lot of people, a lot of ex uh, weightlifters that use hormones end up with some kind of autoimmune issue because basically, I just want to explain this to the audience real quick. Basically, you get an autoimmune issue because of a few things. You have a genetic predisposition, which you can find mm. in your genes. You had a stressful life event, usually, a very stressful event, big change causes the disease to come. And before that, you have a long period of interaction with what are called antigens, things that your body recognizes as damaging them. Originally, your body will send its, its soldiers to the, of the immune system to attack those. Eventually, it starts getting confused and starts attacking other things. Yeah. And then you have a big stressful life event. You end up with Crohn's disease or you end up with, you know, something severe like, a, you know, this kidney thing. Or yeah, something. It, was, it was pretty much able to reverse it completely. I mean, the, the progress that Chris made from one year to the next, that's like Ronnie Col Coleman level progress. You know, yeah. it's yeah. insane. It's incredible. Insane progress. It's like he doubled in size, you know, and he's still underneath the weight limit. So I, I think it's, uh, you yeah, know, I think he's doing everything right. So whoever asked the question, no, I think it was drug free at 18. Yeah. So Not everybody's on the sauce, but unfortunately, most of it has to take sauce to look anywhere close to that. Not if you ask <laughs> Philion, apparently. Philion is this interesting YouTuber I just came across a few weeks, a couple of months ago, I think now. Mm. I finally discovered what he does. Basically, anybody with muscle, he says, is using steroids. Because he's never used steroids. He's, it's a very interesting natty or not. Uh, Everybody on with muscle is, is not natural on that most of, the, most of them take steroids, but there are genetic outliers. And I've seen it in Thailand too, where the guys just fucking blow up. And then they get on the sauce and it's a little bit. And they, they clearly don't know what they're doing. You know, they got horrible guidance oh. and they look better than I do. And then they come off, they PCT, they send me their blood work, their LH, FSH, everything is in range. And they don't lose any size. And you're like, how in the... Have freaking. you ever, Steve, do you remember Michael Lockett? Yeah. Dude, also, he, he turned pro. He, he turned pro at the team universe and he was mm -hmm. telling people like, listen, he turned pro like 210 pounds or whatever. Mm -hmm. He was like, listen, guys, I'm fucking natural. And no, nobody believed him. He was in the muscular development saying he's natural. It's not, nobody fucking believed him. Right. Dude, this dude was like, all right, I'm going to get on gear now because I'm, I turned pro. Yeah. He started competing at 255. Like in the next year, I mean, in one year, he, he went from 210 on stage mm -hmm. to like 255. It was insane. So there is guys like that that are just genetic freaks. Let me tell yeah. you about the craziest genetic freak I ever met. Actually, I met two crazy genetic freaks. One was Egyptian, strongest guy I ever met. That was back in Dubai when I was a kid. But in L.A., I once met a very hardcore Crip gang member in a weird place in L.A. Boston could probably imagine where I met him. But I met this Crip gang member and I was stunned, bro. This place that I was at had no food. The guy can't eat much. The guy's not on steroids. The guy has never lifted a weight in his freaking life. He was a bit shorter than me. He had lats that ha that hung out like this, like like this this much on the side, low, low lats. His arms were 18 and a half inches ripped. His chest was out like unbelievable. I thought, I looked at the guy, I was like, if you were taking five grams, I would, and you were working out for five years, I would believe you. And the yeah. guy is there, he's doing pull-ups, bro. Just pull-ups. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I never seen anything like that. I've been trying to look for him after that to try to. I want to tell the guy you should be a bodybuilder. Think about all the black guys that come out of prison that look insane. That's what yeah. I'm telling. Yeah. <laughs> no, but this guy was doing pull ups every every few days. Not not that often. And and the muscle was just hanging hanging everywhere. So there are Some people like just, that. They they build it, but it doesn't atrophy. Like I I got terribly skinny, you know, after you stopped training and did that fasting mimicking diet to get the non alcoholic fatty liver disease under control. Because you go to home eighty five. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm still surprised I had some muscle left, to be honest, but I, I rebounded quite well. You know, I gained 20 pounds of muscle get, since then. you think then. you're going to go back on cycle? Of course. Of course. Okay. He's going <laughs> no, he's going to regain it's an, everything. It's a freaking addiction, man. I, the longer I do this, the more I realize that. So once how you, long has it been? How long has it been since you ran shit? 
October 2020. But I, when I say I'm off cycle, I, I, I still run growth hormone and I'm running some experiments with peptides. So the experimentation never stops. But <laughs> right, I think when you take the plunge, literally, you know, you start injecting stuff, that's like a life changing event. And even if you go off cycle, you still find like peptides or shit to run on the side. You're like, oh, I can run a little bit of this, a little yeah. bit of that, and improve my quality of life. And you find excuses, you know, just like Leo found an excuse to run tests again. And I need some yeah. resilience. I need resilience. Bam. Yeah, exactly. Bam. Right away. Right? <laughs> no, but and mine it's... happened. Mine happened because, mm -hmm. bro, Steve, it was a real realization. I was thinking it like this. One of the reasons I was off hormones is because I wasn't, I didn't understand epigenetics and I wasn't sure what was going to happen mm -hmm. to my child. Now, my concern is if I'm not on hormones, I may be hypoandrogenic. And I may be, if I have sons later, which is what I plan to do, I may, I may mm -hmm. not be, because I've taken androgens, when I don't take androgens, I might be hypoandrogenic. And that could be a problem. For you know? for, uh, for uh, teaching mor morality, yeah, yeah. No, for the inheritance, they'll inherit. They'll be less uh, aggressive, less virile, and so on. So that was my. So once I thought about that, then I said, okay, there's no, there's no need to keep like very low androgens for this period of time while I'm having kids. You know, right? Yeah. But, but let's yeah, go. So we have we have so many great questions. There's God's with a Z says, uh, well, he says, what health supplements should, could kids and teenagers take to prevent problems from things like high protein intake as a child, or if they have a family history of bad liver or kidneys, etc.? You know, I just wanted to, men I wanted to mention this comment because like the major concern with having a lot of protein as a child is that you may, you may grow a lot, similar to having high growth hormone as a child. And pay people have had a lot of growth hormone as a child uh, injected. They seem to have cardiovascular events when they're older. Um, mm -hmm. longevity scientists like David Sinclair and so on say that you should have low protein throughout your life even in childhood you'll live longer if you do so because you will not be putting that growth pedal to the metal all the time but it's not so much a concern of the kidneys and liver when you're young I really think and mm -hmm. if it is a concern of the kidneys other than managing blood pressure and the weight of the child and and taking free radical scavengers there's not that much you can do you can take free I radical think, I scavengers. think just I think for kids you just put them in a place where they're not in front of the TV and then everything is okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Exactly. You know, as, as silly as it sounds like if I were to raise my kids, I would give them quality food all the way to, and it would be higher protein. Right. Yeah, but I, I would, would also try to stimulate them and, you know, make them understand that the world outside of playing uh, video games and TV. Yeah. Um, you know, you can, you, because you're going to work your ass off behind the computer to, for the rest of your life anyway. So at least try to see the world before that happens. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, and like, let's say the guy that asked this question has some sort of genetic issues in his family. Okay, he needs to be a little bit more cautious because, of course, there's, you know, some genetic uh, problems in his family. And not everybody comes from a genetic background that they can just do whatever or experiment a little bit. Some guys have to be a little bit more cautious. So ideally, this guy should do his blood work and she, see how dieting and training and, and particular health supplementation affect his blood work. And then to do that for a couple of years before even considering to take things to the next level. But for right? example, like, let's say the one thing I would do, if you, if you, are, if you're concerned about kidney things, find out if you have the APOL one variant that makes people much more predispo predisposed toward chronic kidney disease. A Austin, what are you doing? L, wait a minute. <laughs> He's always peeing on camera. APOL one, search that mm -hmm. on S SNpedia.com or on uh, self decode. Uh, you just search APOL one, you'll get the RS number. Search your 23andMe. If you have that variant, don't be worried. Don't take a lot of protein. Don't you ever use steroids. The liver thing, my grandmother died of liver cancer at the age of 50. Mm. She never drank alcohol, 50-something. So I have a predisposition toward NAFLD mm. and hepatocellular carcinoma and so on, but I wouldn't be that concerned about protein on the liver. The concern would be the protein on the kidney, really, I think. Okay, yeah. another, another question by Davis Campbell. He says, what do you think of Paxil as an SSRI? Oh, wait, 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 let me comment one thing. If he's worried about yeah. the protein, stay away from processed protein in the form of whey proteins, creatine, and, and even uh, collagen or gelatin proteins, because those, a lot of them, they metabolize quite fast with gluconeogenesis, and you get a lot of blood urinary or nitrogen in your, in your serum. So that another kidney market will say, so just eat whole quality uh, protein sources from animal meat sources or, or, you know, if you're vegan, then you have some restrictions, obviously. But, yeah. Who's this dog? I've never seen him. That's Gia. That's, the, that's my baby. Oh, she's beautiful. Yeah. Very beautiful. Wow. Okay, so yeah. next, next question. We'll talk about, so this guy asked about Paxil. He says he's been on Paxil 20 milligrams for four years. He figured out it's a low dose. He still has anxiety. He doesn't know if he should raise the dose. I wanted to say Paxil is paroxetine or something like that. It's one of the 
worst SSRIs in terms of side effects, I think specifically weight gain. 20 milligrams, it, it covers a lot of the inhibition of CERT, CERT is the serotonin transporter for some people, but it will not work for you if you have a certain kind of serotonin uh, pro, uh, promoter of the CERT. Specifically, if your promoter of the CERT is long, it will not work. SSRIs will not work for you. So you need to check your genes. And if your BDNF gene, the valmet polymorphism is not the one that responds to SSRIs, you also won't benefit. So you may need to switch from that to something that's non-standard SSRI like amitriptyline, which directly targets the targets of brain-derived neurotrophic factor and nerve growth factor, TRK, A, and B. It directly targets them as the only drug that does that. It will work for you if Paxil doesn't. Also, Paxil is a shitty drug, so you should probably get off it, honestly. <laughs> now, Pitch Attend Brent says, what is your thoughts or what are your thoughts on the phrase grow into your food? I've he heard it said on Fuad's podcast. Boston, what do you think about that? I like that phrase, grow into your food. A lot of people go and they eat massive amount, like, oh, I'm bulking, so they just like go crazy with the calories. When they could grow from very little bumpage of slow calories and stay in shape, so I actually like that term, grow into, yeah, because I, I just feel like you don't just add crazy amounts of food right off the bat. It's something that your body has to adapt to, and mm -hmm. it's something that you have to change over a period of time based on how much muscle you have, how strong your appetite is, and everything else. Yeah, and it's just a slow and steady, gradual process. And, you know, I, I would usually bump the calories up with about 10%. And at one point, you reach a point where you're on so much carbohydrates that you get a protein sparing effect. So you lower the protein a little bit and keep bumping up the carbohydrates as long as you can stomach it because the food volume is so high. Um, and, and, and then you can actually, it's like a cycle, you know, so you're on a, a particular dose of anabolics, you have a particular amount of food intake, you get stronger, you don't get stronger, you start to recomp. And then you increase the calories and you keep doing that until you no longer recomp, you're no longer getting stronger. And then you bump up the drugs and you just, it's a, it, it, it sounds very constant, simple, but I mean, it's a hmm? constant battle right there of, yeah. do I bring up the food or the drugs? It, it, it's a, it's definitely a battle right there. I think first you bring up the food and then mm -hmm. if you notice you're just putting on a bunch of fat, yeah, you, you know what I mean? True. True. Exactly. Yeah. Because sometimes you can bump up the food and then you gain muscle, you get stronger, your stronger stagnates a little bit, but you can start recomping. And then you know that the calories are not sufficient anymore. So you see that they're suddenly getting leaner. You know, some guys are a little bit fatter during the off season, some guys stay leaner, right? So some guys, it's a little bit easier to detect. And then once they start recomping and strength stalls, you just bump up the food again and bump yeah. up the food again. And then at one point they won't recomp, and just get fat. Yeah. And then you bump up the drugs. Yeah, exactly. Or, I, I you agree with know, percent Yeah. And it, it, it just, and so you, you see my cycles, beginner cycles, like 250 tests. Like, this is it. I said, don't worry, a year from now, it'll be 10 times more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll get there. That's we'll why I, there. Tell, I tell people, if I was to do it all over again, if I was to mm. go back in time, I would have started so low and only upped it when I hit a plateau. If that question's I'll, coming. They're going to ask you that. <laughs> the question is coming exactly so wait the next guy is his name is right left which i think is a song by yg that i actually like right left says any insight on bodybuilding with hypothyroidism which is what we we're talking about with palumbo earlier i mean palumbo mentioning that you know people taking t4 for hypothyroidism anyway it says does levothyroxine which is lt4 have an impact on training or muscle growth uh, i thought maybe i could just answer this quickly from a scientific scientific perspective your muscles have t3 receptors in them and hypothyroid people have worse muscular function and uh, subclinical hypothyroidism, which means when you have high TSH, but your T3, your free T3 is not low, your free T3 is normal, you still have worse function muscularly. If you add LT4 in, it doesn't improve. There are studies that show that. It seems to need more T3, even if your TSH is just high. I'm not completely sure if that works though, but, but T T4 by itself doesn't work. So basically if you're hypothyroidal, you will develop muscle worse. You need to mm -hmm. resolve it somehow. What do you guys think? I think it's also the metabolism and, and the, the conversion of uh, building blocks, you know, into skeletal muscle. So sometimes like I have a couple of clients with, that came to me with high thyroid stimulating hormone, and then you incrementally bump up the T4 dosages until they, um, until their, you know, TSH comes down and they're free and their total T3 are within range, but you don't want that too high. Because otherwise it has a, a catabolic effect. That's why I, I'm not really a big fan of T3 supplementation on contest prep, even with a ton of trembolone. It's I, I was due to a replacement dose of 25 micrograms, and that's where I keep it. But you also got to remember that if your metabolism increases, your food intake also needs to increase. And 
T4 and T3 also contribute to sigma binding globulin production. So some guys might experience you know, some libido loss because their T4 and T3 uh, levels elevate significantly and then their sigma binding globulin goes very high. Of course, you can suppress that with androgens, but not everybody's on androgens. Did you know so, that ghrelin modulates steroidogenesis in the testicles? I just discovered this, shockingly. I didn't know this. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna do a little serious a, It explains a freaking lot because yeah. uh, I, I've had so many libido consultations with guys that did post cycle therapy and then their testosterone is low because they, their appetite is not good, mm-hmm. you know, so they cascade into the griddle levels. Yeah, it's... Yeah. So uh, he also asked, he said, I've heard many experts give gear dosage, dosage recommendations based off a mathematical equation using a person's body weight. Other experts say that a person's response to androgens has nothing to do with their size. If someone were 130 pounds versus 200 pounds starting the same cycle, would they notice a difference assuming all other factors are the same? I hate that. That's that Broderick. Chavez. That's Broderick. I know. <laughs> I knew it was him. Dude, I do that fucking, though. I, I do that. Dumb. Do you that's know so he's funny. doing a series with Fouad now? Like they're traveling yeah. around the world, misinforming that. people together. No, they're, doing <laughs> they're doing webinars, so they're going to be charging oh. people. Okay, oh, wow. so they're going on online and misinforming people together. It's, <laughs> it's an excellent combination. One guy thinks he knows everything; the other guy doesn't know anything, knows he doesn't, but he's going to talk anyway. <laughs> I, do, I do use this. This I do use the calculation though sometimes, especially to design cruises. It's the lowest effective dose. What I've seen with a lot of clients is that you know, as long as you stick with one milligram testosterone per one pound of body weight, you get to keep all your gains during a cruise. So if you're three hundred pounds, three hundred test. I just don't think yeah. anything should be looked at about uh, at numbers because yeah. everyone's going to respond differently. Yeah, that's uh, true. Right. Everyone has different genetics. Let's let's just kill let's just kill this topic once and for all. Okay, it's simple. You guys all have different androgen receptors. There's over ninety androgen receptor polymorphisms that can make your androgen receptor less receptive than somebody else's. So how the hell would we all equate just based on body weight? Why don't you judge our androgen receptor genes? Why don't you judge something else? Also, this is the same reason I get a, I get frustrated Boston when somebody goes to a doctor and they're like uh, for example they're like I'm going bald the doctor's like oh let me test your DHT in your blood the hell does that have to do with it I'm going bald whether my DHT is high or low I'm sensitive to the DHT so I'm going bald you know yeah. or you could I mean you could be going bald for another reason but if it's like, a male I'm, I'm clearly bald, not and I'm clearly not <laughs> sensitive right we don't know like that I, Steve because you cut your hair in a perfect way where if you were going bald I wouldn't be able to tell yeah it's a it's little bit but sneaky. my dad it, and my grandpa it's pretty my grandparents sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing, you know? Yeah, I'm hiding it. Yeah, it's my way to hide it. Boston, but I can take dude, a, Boston. A, Look at Boston. I can take a ton of Primo and Mastro and nothing happens. No hair loss whatsoever. Yeah, Wait. I never I never got any hair loss ever. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But Some, fuck, dude, I get scared because everyone's like, I lost it at 30. Like I 30 know. was their age. And I'm like 29. And I'm like, fuck, am I going to start losing my hair next year? <laughs> I'm 37, so don't worry about it. <laughs> no, know, don't worry about it. Something weird does happen at 30. I'll be honest. I think there's, there's so, yeah. Oh, your body shuts down. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like you recognizing. Know, like, oh, but Leo, responding you know? to that question, I think black people, African Americans, they respond way better. Like whatever yeah. you said, that's why you can't give dosages, uh, you know, based on body weight. I have guys that I could put on so little and they keep responding and I'm like, wow, they just keep responding. And there's other guys that don't respond shit, uh, you know, so it's, it's all different. Yeah. Yeah. I I usually consider it a starting point and then there's always some additional adjustments to make sure that it actually works. So some guys end up lower, some guys end up higher. Right. Like I've had clients on their own, like a, a cycle of a gram or one and a half grams for over a year and their blood work doesn't budge. It's all in range. All of it. Well, my, my cholesterol will be in range. Yeah. If I do that, yeah. for example, my oh, cholesterol, cholesterol, liver enzymes, kidney function, well, everything's a gr- a in range. A gram of anabolics to me is little. Yeah. Okay. That's Boston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, run a gram, I run a gram of each. I mean, shit, I'm in kidney failure and I'm running and I refuse to run anything under what? Like, I'm on. Wait, hold on. <laughs> I'm on I, I was on like a gram and a half i think or a gram you, you, yeah. you, you're never thinking about stopping and giving your body a little yeah. break no i did i did i came no, off like a real time. break like i did you know like no a no, no, no no i did for three yeah. months okay. no training mm-hmm. no drugs for three fucking months dude no experience oh, okay no okay everything low protein did it all and then like my creatinine still went up it went worse, yeah. That's why. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's. Yeah. I mean, how are you? You think about it psychologically. It's really hard. You, you're doing no, your best, and tough. the creatinine keeps rising. Yeah. I mean, uh, the I same thing. With on, the... I did stay on 100 megs of testosterone. That's it. 
Okay, no, that's acceptable. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's very frustrating if you're doing everything you can and it's not improving. I had that with the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I came off and I did all the health supplementation and then it improved like 50% over like six months. And I'm like, fuck this, I'm just going to stop eating. Exactly. You know? I'm doing an experiment now, Leo, that you'll be interested in. So I was doing that astrologus that everyone is like, dude, it's the only thing that helps your kidneys, astrologus, astrologus, astrologus. So, but I was only taking like seven to nine grams a day. So I talked to this guy that that's very knowledgeable in the industry, Mike Arnold. He told me that he knows multiple people that he had take 30 grams of astrologus a day, 10 grams, three times a day. Yep. And they went and their GFRs went from in their teens, like anywhere from 13 to 15 all the way into their mid thirties wow. uh, in a pretty fast period of time. So I said, you know what? This shit's cheap. Uh, I went on bulk supplements.com for $30. I bought a two pound bag of astrologus mm -hmm. and I'm taking scoops of this shit three times a day, dude, like 10 grams, dude, <laughs> that shit makes you shit like crazy. That <laughs> does it really it cleans you out so much. Like your shit smells like the astrologus powder. What the yeah. Hell? That's a lot of fiber. So, so I, I did a very high dose of astragalus as well. I think it was 20 grams, but it, okay. it didn't change anything for my creatinine. But my cystatin and seeds dropped to the bottom of the reference range. I, so that's now it's like zero point. How high was your creatinine? So the highest I've seen after a leg day was like 1.92 milligrams per deciliter. And then the lowest I got it up to after the fasting mimicking diet was 0 0.9. Wow. So you were yeah. able to drop it from 1.9 to 0.9? No, so mine hovered around like 1.5 most of the time and it's with training. And then if I would take two weeks off, it would come down like 0 0.1, 0 0.2%. So let's say I'm between 1.3 to 1.5. Yeah. And that's running estragalus root at a maintenance dose for like six grams per day, four grams, six grams per day. Yeah. And it, it, it never budged my creatinine. Only my cystat and C kept getting lower and lower and lower. Yeah, and lower. but your creatinine was never that high. I, the, 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 the stories that I've seen that astrologist does wonders and was guys are like... 3.3.5, yeah. you know, all exactly. Time. Yeah, very, very high creatinine. So you just have to persist with that with a very high dose and and, and stay hydrated, you know, or maybe I'm going to I'm I'm try it. I said it's 30 bucks. I bought this big ass bag. But dude, that shit makes you shit all day long. Holy fuck. Yeah. Dude. I'm no, going to run it. Smells it like it. I'll do it too, Boston. I'm going to start doing it tomorrow. I'll try to try it with you. <laughs> I have yeah, a bunch of it. I want to see what will happen. You have astrologist powder? Of course. I can't resist. <laughs> I'll join you. This is like steroids for me now. This is what I do. Yeah, you got it here. <laughs> I'll start I doing Derek's. 30 tomorrow. <laughs> I got We're Derek's uh, astragalus. <laughs> okay, wait. He there's has a, one there's last another, one. There's another one. Maybe maybe you've heard about this, uh, Leo. It's called acacia root uh, gum fiber. Acacia gum fiber. That some well, of the Arabs use that. Products. Yeah, and yeah. It, that also helps. And you, you mix that with uh, like some fiber. And then your, your poop smells like acacia gum. And it's like a sweet, I don't know, it smells like a soap almost. I, you notice that? Do you notice that astrologus is kind of sweet? Yeah. And I, I got the same with the acacia gum fiber. So I ran both for quite a while and that, that improved the levels a little bit. But, you know, the most thing that it improved was get, coming off everything and just stopping training altogether. So just, I just want the audience to know that like, these things work through free radical scavenging by reducing stress at the kidney, which is really yeah. powerful. So you could also mm. potentially go do IV vitamin clinics multiple times a week. Could Potentially, those things could also help. Um, but of course, those are more expensive. But there are a lot of other things like alpha lipoic acid, so many other free radical scavengers that I like that I take all day. Boston, you might want to eventually experiment with some of those, of course. I don't know a lot of, unless they're very good at scavenging free radicals, they could put stress on your kidney. So you have to choose the right ones, the most potent one, not necessarily the most potent, but the most agreeable to you. And you should, by the way, Boston, if you're not taking melatonin, melatonin is one of the best free radical scavengers. I take 10 MIGs every night. Perfect. Okay. I take 40, just so you know, because wow. it's, it's that powerful. <laughs> it's that powerful, but it inhibits some steroidogenesis when you do that. But what's great about melatonin, bro, so it's not, it doesn't just scavenge free radicals as melatonin. As it gets metabolized by scavenging, it keeps on each level scavenging free radicals. It's like seven or eight levels. It's one of the best you free radicals. You take it all before bed? Yeah, I take it before bed, but bro, they, they have so many studies showing like people with ALS, people with Parkinson's, people with crazy uh, inflammatory diseases. If they inject melatonin, it just neutralizes their C-reactive protein, everything. Oh, wow. It's you really know, You know what's crazy, Leo? Is I, I have this liquid melanotan and melatonin. It's like 10 milligrams per ml. That stuff, dude, it hits me like three times harder than the tabs. It's nuts. That it's, no, it goes very fast. Yeah. It's not well absorbed. That's why. So it's much better to inject it. If I didn't know you had, you should probably. No, I'm not injecting it. It was. It's oral that I put in my mouth. 
Oh, yeah, sublingual, like right? You put it underneath your tongue, and then ten minutes yeah, later, you hold, like, it, you hold it in your under your tongue for like thirty seconds. That shit hits me way quick. Yeah. His other question was, what would you all recommend for your first cycle if you had to repeat your first cycle? What would you change? Dosages and compounds. I'll let Steve, I'll let Steve go on first. Test GH insulin under guidance. Yeah, how about the dose? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 250 test. Uh, uh, so for myself or ge just general answer? Yourself. Your, your first myself. cycle. If you could redo it yourself. 250 test, add in the growth hormone for two units a couple, couple weeks later, and then add in the insulin. How much insulin and when? Post workout and then later on, uh, add in the long acting insulin. Lantus, like one oh, IU. Uh, I can't say according to body weight, right? So ten units of Lantus <laughs> upon waking. Yeah, that would be that would be it. Well, Just so identical like, hormones. How much, how much humalog post workout? Five. Okay, so you see, okay, so it's low. All right, I, yeah. I, it's crazy that that he would actually have insulin on our first cycle. <laughs> He likes, he right, likes so, bioidentical stuff. That's why I like like, I like bioidentical yeah. stuff because I know how the body responds, right? And with with I would I would say Primo probably is the second anabolic steroid. Um, but all things considering, from all the blood work that I've seen and all the research that I've done, this bioidentical stuff is just the best best bang for your buck. And uh, like a combination of test GH and insulin will give you so much more muscle and density and workout capacity compared to throwing in three anabolics. Right at moderate doses, and then you have to worry about your hematocrit and your liver enzymes, and and yeah, the blood work is not that dramatically changed with GH and insulin, especially if you're able, you know, to stay on top of your diet. And, and on, that all cycle, my, be, on that cycle, are you running an an, an antiestrogen or no? Probably not. Just daily injections, thirty milligrams a day, thirty five. I've had several clients who you know they come to me and they're very dedicated, right? They're full time bodybuilders, but they haven't taken a steroid yet. Test couple of weeks gh if they can afford it and then insulin and they blow the fuck up you know what and they're like you? yeah i want to do men's physique and then they end up being a bodybuilder <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, you know, if, I, if i could go all the way back i started gear at 17 yeah. so i i mean i doubt if steve started his cycle at 17 he would be running 26 insulin, yeah 26. <laughs> so it, my first cycle if i could do it all over again would be 250 megs of testinante twice a week so 500 megs total with a half mega Rimidex every other day. That's it. And, and, that's and it, I, would, yeah. I would ride that out as long as I could. Okay, that's a similar thought process. So for me, yeah. I, I, I first started getting to steroids when I was 15 or 16 years old. But the problem is that I decided not to use them when I... A couple of things happened. Number one, I was like, maybe I'll use them later because I got scared off a little bit. Second thing was I went to a hospital and x-rayed my growth plates to figure out if I could grow taller if I use growth hormone when I was 15, by the way. This is no joke. Like 2002, I did this. But they told me my growth plates were closed. They were wrong. I realize now I could have grown a little bit taller. So if I were to go back and knowing what I know now, I was scared before that the, the steroids would stop me from growing. That's one of the main reasons I stopped. They wouldn't have done that. So what I would have done if I could go back is go on HCG and FSH, go on a strong AI and take Anavar and potentially growth hormone. Anavar, I would ride out for as long as I could before I stopped getting gains. Because Anavar- There's going to be like a theory. thousand kids copying this protocol No, I tomorrow. would not tell kids to do this, but I would have done this. If I, if I could go back, I personally would have done this. Right. By the way, the danger is- I'm glad you said that. So you would, you would have took gear at 15, right? I would have taken gear at 16 if I if I went back now. Yeah, I, I think 15, 16- Much better man. time. You grow the best. Yeah. You, I would have had way better results because. All right, let's, let, let's let's put a question in, in for let's let's say let's say Steve, let's say you had a kid that was 15 years old. Okay, you see that he has sick genetics. Like this kid is fucking sick, and he was in bodybuilding. He wanted to compete. He was at that level. You're like this kid could do this for his life. Like it would set him up. <laughs> would you, would you let him take anabolics at 15? No. <laughs> No, hell no. No, because I like my wife is pretty good genetics, right? And then I have don't have so good, good gen at least my structure is not so good. So let's say that my, our kids get the best of all worlds and they have amazing shape and amazing uh, response to uh, pharmaceuticals, right? I would still tell them to wait until at least 21, you know, build the foundation as corny as it sounds, build that foundation first and develop yourself as a person because for 99% of the people, bodybuilding is not going to pay off. It's not going to pay yeah, off. Well, and that, it, that, was, that was the debate that one of my friends had of me. It's like if you knew your kid was destined to be something special in sports or, 
you know, whatever it was, would you, would you let him supplement at a young age? And it, I'm not going to answer this on here because I'm going to get a lot of heat, but, uh, but uh, I, it's a very good question. Boston, I'll answer it. I would be Chad Nichols. If that happened, yeah. I would be doing what, what Chad I Nichols is doing. I was just going to go there. I was just going to go there. Well, I, would, I would put him on like non-suppressive compounds like a turkestrone or ICD steroids and just, just get as far as possible without downregulating the HPTA because I do think that it's important during <laughs> puberty and later stages, you know? Can't downregulate if you got FSH and HCG in How about you think it's something well, that's, like DHEA yeah. would help? Huh? Sorry? DHEA. You think it would help a kid? No, only only girls mm, usually. Yeah, I don't know. Girls. Maybe maybe it's a kid if it's young. It could be. There's no trials on kids, right, Steve? I haven't seen any with DHEA. No, not that I, I know. I, I would I maybe supplement a little bit of GHRP six. You know, get the kid to eat and uh, and and consider turkestrone as a non-suppressive anabolic, and just optimize everything else. And then when when they've earned it, really earned it on my under my supervision, and I'm very scrutinous. Then I would say, okay, now you can, you know, jump on test and the GH in the lens and I'll pay for everything. And I'll guide them through it. And the first sign they start, they start bitching and say, oh, the water retention, I'm getting watery and uh, the girls don't find me attractive. You're off. You're going to do PCT. <laughs> you, guys remember you, want the games? Her- you guys remember little Hercules? Yeah. yeah. Ah, no, Check this out. So this, this is crazy. Cause I used to guest pose for bodybuilding when I was six years old and we were around the same age. He might've been a year older than me. His name was Richard. And he came into the gym that my parents used to own one day. And, dude, this kid was fucking – I was like – I used to get a lot of attention back then because I was guest posing and shit like that. And this kid came out of nowhere, same age as me, but just crazy muscular, like that nobody's ever seen muscularity on a kid like this. And, like, you know, they were, the parents were claiming natural. They were telling my parents, my kid – so anyways, I don't know if you know, but that the, the guy, his dad ended up going to jail. He got busted for giving no his kid steroids. No way. Oh, wow. It turned out. Yeah. You yeah. I knew so, it. So he ended up going to jail. They had a documentary on it and everything, Leo. Wait, no and way. And yeah. the kid now has gyno. Dude, he's fat. It's crazy. It's crazy. The kid is just so out of shape now. It's insane. His name is Richard something. Richard yeah. something. Yeah. Because if you do that to a child without HCG, FSH, stuff like that, and it's, even if it's a child with HCG, FSH, you're going to destroy. If it's a child, you're going to destroy them because the, the, you could use growth hormone, but you can't use andro- oh, androgen. Oh, screw them. Yeah, that'll screw them up. Yeah, pro hormones probably, just tablets. You know, I don't think uh, you said it's a multivitamin. No, it was, Let's go it take was, it. They said it was Anabar. Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, oh okay. my God. He looked yeah. like it was on some Anabar. That guy's abs yeah, were crazy. For sure. Yeah, they, they said it was Anabar. And, okay. and you know what the weird is? Like uh, when I went to school, there were like always like 15 or 16 year olds that would take oral only cycles, right? And it would blow up to be huge, a little bit balloony. And then you meet them like five years, 10 years later at some reunion party and they look like nothing. They didn't go through with it. So that's why I'm always a little bit hesitant to start early. You know, if you form yourself as an individual, like Boston, I'm sure you know some guys that started around your age and they're nowhere to be found in the fitness industry. Well, that was kind of like me, man. When I was like 17, I was taking the pro hormones, the m mm-hmm. the X-Stain, the, the competitive edge labs. And everyone was like, holy shit, dude, to this day, this is the strongest stuff I've ever used. Stronger yeah, than any drums. steroid I've ever used. And in like my bench went up 70 pounds in three weeks. But dude, when the minute you come off that shit, first of all, I was lactating everywhere. I remember when you were lactating. <laughs> I was lactating everywhere, and I was in that. I got soft and fat after the cycle, so it goes to show you that those things just make you crash terribly. Wait, Steve, have yeah. you ever lactated? Uh, allegedly. Me too, <laughs> but not as bad as Boston. So, Mine was so, a little so bit. Weird, no, no, not, not the weird squirts out, but I've had like periods when I was running Trimble and I was like, why am I nipple so puffy? And you just squeeze it a little bit and all One this brown goo, oh. all brown fucking goo comes out. And you're like, yeah, okay, it's like I got a dark green. Right, it's nasty, right? And then you milk it and it's gone. It smells nasty. Yeah, right. And you milk it and uh, I have to say this, you milk it, right? And then four weeks later, it comes back. You have to do it again. And now, yeah. So, and then sometimes I I check if that's still occurring. But luckily after my last trend cycle, about six years ago, yeah, it hasn't happened again. Austin, Steve still has not had his glands removed. So he's actually under threat of this. This could happen again to you. Right. Uh, yeah, actually, but I, I, I'm going to stick to this. Bro, it's the best, it's the best surgery. Get, he it's could probably get fucking his glands removed for like $1,000 in Thailand. It's such a fun uh, surgery. Like it's the $2, best surgery. 2200 Yeah, 2200 You want to do it? It's so worth it. And I, I don't want to be, have the eight week down period, which I should have done, you know, at the fasting mimicking diet. I was but... training four days later. What? Really? I, 
I was out for like four months. I lost they all my told, muscle. They told me to wait four weeks, but I start. I started four days later. <laughs> you know, serious? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I should have. I was, I, doing I, lat, I was doing lat pull downs and I pulled out a stitch. Yeah, I could I barely pull my arm up. I don't know how you could do a lat pull down. Mine was stuck like the muscle got. I stuck. was doing half reps like this, and I actually pull, I, I pulled the stitch out. So yeah. dedicated. And it's starting right. the lactating and bleeding from the nipple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, hey, I tell you what, though, when they end up removing your gland, you never lactate again. Yeah, it's beautiful. No. Mm-hmm. Can, nothing can happen. I used to squirt it's like 10 feet. And, like, I couldn't do shit after the surgery. But I, if I ever do the surgery, I will let them grow, you know? So I'm going to go and test an androlone and anadrol and just grow all the tissue so they don't miss anything. <laughs> That's actually not just, a bad idea, by the way. That's actually not I a bad that, idea. I put that in the estrogen ebook. I have several yeah. clients who did that. I have a Gianni Camassi, and I said, test the uh, anandrolone and anadrol, grow everything, and then the surgeon doesn't miss any, anything. It's true. They do miss like, sometimes. Yeah. It's like a huge bowl, you know, yeah. and, and they get it all removed and it looks beautiful a couple That's months later. That's why you got to go to a good surgeon, though, Leo, because there's so many surgeons that don't get the gland and it comes right back. The best one yeah. is actually Newport Beach. That's the guy I went to. He's extremely good. He's better than that guy on the East Coast. The there's guy one that here in to, that. All the, all the pro bodybuilders that, that went to the guy that I went to, Dr. Blau. You like Blau? He That's told I heard that he messes. Oh, you know who told me that, though, Nick? I don't know if it's true. Does he really mess people up? Is it? I, I've heard nothing but good things. I mean, everyone goes to him. The guy here, I forgot his name, but he's he's fantastic. He only does gynecomastic master surgery. He's in Newport Beach. He's unbelievable. He's very expensive, like fifteen thousand more than Blau, I think. But he's very very good. Listen, yeah, the- I only charge. I only paid six thousand cash back then, mm-hmm. and it, it was going to be nine thousand if I wanted to go fully under. I said no. I'm going to save the three thousand and just. And no, just- it's better not to go fully under. But then you wake up in the middle and you feel somebody like. Like ripping go. <laughs> I, 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 they gave you footballs to squeeze. <laughs> I woke up. Stress balls. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. This is still happening. Like, the, like I'm awake. I you told feel, you. Feel the tugging. Yeah, the tugging, man. Oh, that's such so funny. Okay, so uh, Signoretti says, "Damn, this is the podcast I've been waiting for." Coach Steve's honest opinion on peak Boston at the NPC border clash. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had Steve so check then- out the pictures ahead of time. <laughs> okay. We'll put them. Boston. We'll put them in the clip. I'll have. I'll have them overlaid. But I like your arms, Boston. They're nice and full. That's true. Yeah, thank you. I was thawing the shit out of them. <laughs> I saw. I saw. <laughs> so I think. I think the only thing you need to improve on this this show is the chest a little bit, and a little bit more back width, and and try to fill out those legs. That that would be my only suggestion. Now yeah, maybe my get the arm. And my legs. Suck. But wait, wasn't yeah. the question if I should have won? No, the question was his opinion, but but should you should he? Oh. Who, who was his comp- who? Oh. Cornelius. <laughs> Cornelius. <laughs> Cornelius is gonna get offended. He, he follows. I think he this. he preemptively sent me a couple uh, compliments a couple months ago, just in case I would ever do a <laughs> podcast with uh, Boston Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> Lenny Lenny was honest about it. Lenny was like, "Yeah, I don't know how he won." And then, and then Cornelius was like, I can't believe Lenny said that. <laughs> Cornelius takes things seriously. This is this is the problem with competition, you know, and I see it here in the amateur circuit as well. It's like popularity or uh, unpopularity. It moves you a place or two, you know, no matter how good you are. Or when well, they get I mean, tired I was of the popular one, but I had the 3CC in my hair. He, you know, he had a gym in that area. He knew all the judges. I mean, it was, it was no, pretty No, it doesn't popular. help. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't help. No, there's a couple of things to improve, but it's uh, overall you look good, man. It's a little bit better conditioning, a little bit you know bigger line, but this is yeah, always that something was my, to improve. That man. was my warm up show, actually. My my main show was four weeks after that, but mm-hmm. after that, man, I was I, I, me and Ariella, we, we we got back together. We were talking, we got back together, and I was like, you know what, I'm not going to do another four weeks. But see, at that at that point, I I kept EQ in. Mm-hmm. Um, I had pulled it like a week out. Usually I, I pull EQ about five weeks out. So I pulled the EQ out five weeks out from my main show. I used a little bit of Halo, but not as much as I was using the main show. And you know what I was going to add in at the very end, which I never got to, to ever try, was mm. Primo Acetate at like 150 megs a day. Yeah, I don't, I don't usually don't see a benefit of that. Really? Over- I've, heard, I've heard really good things about high dose Primo Acetate. Over, over the Halo Testin and the Super Draw cocktail that most guys run at the end, you know, which diuretic did you use? I hate, I hate using a lot of diuretics. So I use, I use the half. I think the biggest problem with bodybuilders peaking for shows is they use diuretics on the show day. I yeah. use the half. I use the half a diazide at 11 a.m. on Friday, mm-hmm. and then I use another half at 8 p.m. Um, okay. And I re- I removed all sodium 
all day long. Yeah, that's what that's what I was going to say because you're a little that bit flat, the especially biggest, in the legs. That was the biggest game changer for me. The night before, I was watery. I had I'm very sodium sensitive. My glutes were not mm. in at all. And oh, okay. Just, just from pulling the sodium and, and dropping the diazide, I dried up drastically. No, I wasn't flat, man. I just I just didn't have the muscle. I, I just didn't have the muscle. Did you did you reintroduce the sodium after you woke up? Like a on little bit show, of sodium with each show, meal? On the show day when the water's gone, yes, I, I add sodium yeah. back in. Okay. But and I you have any in, insulin and injectable in. and adenosine phosphate, uh, triphosphate? No, I didn't know. No, okay. <laughs> I did, Just checking. I did shoot Nolotil though the night before. You know, what I will say for the audience also, like when I look at your pictures and besides the, the arms that are uh, clearly a little bit larger than they were intended to be, you have very minimal amount of scar tissue over your body. Besides yeah, the arm and then the, the arms being jimmied up. But I would expect like lumps and bumps everywhere, you know, considering you've done pretty, pretty big dosages, but I don't see that. And yeah, I've seen my, it. My body heals pretty well from the shots. Yeah, so it's it's either the quality of the gear or you're you're you know the administrator of uh, you know a perfect I go, administrator. I I, uh, I probably would say because I go so deep. You know what I mean? He's That's trying to hit the said. bone when he injects. He's looking for the bone. <laughs> but Boston, I got to tell you something funny. Remember that arm wrestling thing that you were gonna do? You I had did. some. I did. So, so I just found out, listen, today I had a podcast with an arm wrestling guy and he was, I told him, you know, Boston Lloyd, he's like, of course I know Boston Lloyd. I was like, oh, you, cause he's Russian. He's like, did you know that Boston Lloyd is more famous in Russia than America? And everyone in Russia knows Boston Lloyd and all the Russian arm wrestlers know him. I was like, oh, that's great. Then he's like, you know what? He's in Florida. He's like, I heard Boston was going to arm wrestle some guy. I was going to drive five hours to see him. I was like, who's this guy? He's like, no, he's a real arm wrestler. I was like, oh shit, boss, I was telling you not to arm wrestle real arm wrestlers. They're going to break your arm. <laughs> well, he was real, well he, the guy is like number one in Florida for- uh, Yeah, he's a real arm wrestler. Yeah, you should don't, don't, don't arm wrestle that guy. Hey, but you know what, dude? And I injured my pec the, the, the week before and I said, I can't back out. So I said, hey man, I can't do my right arm because I have this pec. I was like, let's do left arm because I can't do the right. And he was cool with that. He's actually better with his left than he is with his right. So that fucked me. <laughs> you know that thing that you hold? Yeah. Thing you hold? I was feeling pressure on my chest, but dude, I swear to God, I was fucked up for at least 10 days. My shoulder was in so much pain, dude. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not it's, it's very how, dangerous. <laughs> that's how Ian Valier uh, broke his arm, and uh, Victor Martinez also. Yeah. Wait, Ian Valier broke his arm arm wrestling? He yeah, has he's full, got a huge he scar. Has a full surgery. <laughs> Holy shit! I've never yeah. known that. And Victor Martinez? Yeah, Victor Martinez also. How did I not know this? This and is so Rich Rich Piana did some wrestling, and then he tore his patella, and and. Rich Piana, Rich Piana, so Rich Piana actually came to my arm wrestling gym in, in LA mm. with my coach and with Scott and arm wrestled there and filmed it. And it's on YouTube. My mm. coach, who's the one who arm wrestled and taught him to arm wrestle in the video. I talked to him after I was like, how is it arm wrestling with Rich? He's like, I've never felt a hand like that in my life. He said, when I grabbed his hand, it was like pieces of grass, glass breaking. All the, all, everything was weak and everything made noise. He said, as I moved the, the bone, everything, it just felt like a, there was no strength. He said zero strength. And then uh, later I also, I found out, of course, Rich used to bring fake weights to the gym. So every, every lift he was doing in that gym was with fake weights. That's why we had an argument. That's why me and Rich got an argument when I was down there. Cause not an argument, but he, he wanted to film with fake weights. And I said, Hey, I said, I won't be doing these videos with the fake weights. We were, we were in the pit at the, the gold Venice. We were in the pit with all of his 5% crew. And he wanted to do all this fake five weight. Uh, the plates were like 10 pounds. The 45s were like, they're so light. And he was like, oh, it's just for show and this and that. I'm like, sorry, man, I can't be involved in this. Yeah, it, Boston yeah, has amazing uh, ethics. By the way, Boston does that all the time privately. Like I talk to Boston about stuff and he's like, I can't, I can't do this. Yeah, there's so some things you just, like, uh, you know. <laughs> all right, guys. Yeah. So, so Gras, Gras, Graciano Gabriel asks a question that Boston's going to love. He says, best drug for blood pressure for bodybuilders. Is it tell me Sartan versus Val Sartan? I think officially I can stop answering this question. Boston is now totally aware of everything. What do you think? The, the best one that I had at lowering my blood pressure, if I had to pick one, right? Is that the question? Just one, if I had to pick one? Yeah, yeah, he's, he's picking one. Out of all the, out of everything I've tried, the thing that lowered me the most was the Ramapril. The ACE inhibitor Ramipril, which is a yeah. very valid ACE inhibitor. I made a post on my story last week about two interesting ACE inhibitors. I don't know as much about ACE inhibitors because they're more extreme. Uh, if you don't have kidney problems like Boston, it becomes when you have kidney problems, your blood pressure just skyrockets. It's really hard to control. 
So at that point, it's different. But for, for a bodybuilder, the cleanest ARB, the most selective is Valsartan. Um, Telmisartan, the problem is it's going to make you gain a bit of fat. If you don't want to gain fat, you're a bodybuilder, you may not want Telmisartan. The gaining of the fat comes from the PPR gamma receptor, which is healthy, prevents you probably from storing, keeping fat in your blood, like having high triglycerides, stuff like that, but may make you store a little bit more fat. Irbisartan is the, is the ARB that's known to potentially improve uh, function in chronic kidney disease. Azelsartan is the strongest ARB of all. So if you want to pick an ARB, which are less, they, they cause, because ARBs leave one receptor signaling open and that receptor is pro-growth. Like it does, that receptor does the same things as BPC-157, TB-500, stuff like that. So if you want that recovery, you may want to use an ARB. If you want a sledgehammer, use an ACE inhibitor. Leo, no, why, feel- why do doctors not like to prescribe um, Herbisartan and Alzasartan? They're they're not see doctors don't like to prescribe things that they're not used to. It's difficult to prescribe something you've not prescribed before, and they're not that commonly prescribed. That's the reason. Okay. Because they're so extreme. Because I've talked to so many people with kidney diseases, and I've I haven't heard one doctor that has prescribed it. So right now, uh, Leo, and I'm responding very well to it. My blood pressure is the best it's ever been. Is uh, Valsartan 80 megs in the morning um, with Ramapril 5 megs morning and night, and then I'm doing the Cardiva 6.25 milligrams morning and night. And my blood pressure is at like 130 over 70, which for me, that's like awesome. Finally. Oh, that's – congratulations. Mm, that's we that's finally good. got that's to 130. Oh, so you, you know what protocol that is? That's what? the protocol that, that our buddy Bo uh, uses. The, the only extreme one, yeah. The only difference is he was taking the max dose on both. I'm taking the half dose on both. So he was doing uh, 160 Valsartan with 10 mg uh, twice a day of Ramapril. I'm just doing half of what he was doing. But the, but I added in the Cardivas because my my resting heart rate was was like over a hundred. Mm, that's oh wow, that's, that's fantastic. Because your blood pressure was too low, or no, it's too high with the heart rate. Too, uh, with the, yeah, no, but maybe the blood pressure came too low, so his heart rate picked up. That he, also he had happens. a high heart rate and a high blood pressure. Frequency. Oh okay, yeah. so yeah. I had the similar, but it, now I'm running five milligrams of Nabivolol and and twenty milligrams of Telmersartan. For your I, information, my my exercise performance does not go down on Nabivolol. Hey, tell him about Nabivolol. He's never tried it. He like he's interested. So, yeah. so Nabivolol, it's uh, it's like a, a beta blocker for clen users. Uh, it's beta-1 selective, but it uh, blocks the beta-1 receptor, but it also ag- uh, agonizes the beta-3 receptor. So you might get, you know, it's the same as what they said about Thomas Arta, and it might be a little bit of performance enhancing benefits. Carvinol what I noticed... Like that too, yeah. Yeah. So what I noticed with the Nobivolol, I started using it first. I think it was one of the questions. I started using Nobivolol during a carb up because mm-hmm. my heart rate would pick up and it was annoying, right? Your, your carbohydrate depleted during the week. I usually do a ketogenic diet with... Atlantis, I'm sure Boston is familiar. Um, so I would do a ketogenic diet during the week. And then in the weekend, I would do a, you know, like a 500, 600, 800 carb refeed, right? And my heart rate would just go sky high. So I would how, use high, how high are we talking? Like, like 100 resting. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was uncomfortable, right? And that's, and you did it, it, no, no clenbuterol or anything, other stimulants in my body and not using clen or anything for a week, right? Normally you would use a little bit of clen to get lean. Um, so I would take that out and then I would use five milligrams of Nabivolol and lower the carbs and then I would fill out better. So I'd eat less and use the beta blocker to keep my heart rate down. So I'm preserving I do, calories. I do notice, so I do notice when I was on the heavy antenolol, which is a beta blocker, mm-hmm. my muscles were, f- were, f- were fuller, but it was harder for me to, to lose fat and harden up. Yeah, I, didn't, I, yeah. I have the same thing right now. So five milligrams of Nabivolol and 20 milligrams of Telmasartan, not very conducive to uh, get lean, obviously, but I, at this point, it's not really important to me, but it's, it's very easy. To, it almost feels anabolic. It almost, but I'm not on steroids, obviously, but when I, when I train, I'm like, this is, I look too good for not being on steroids. Well, 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 there's one thing also, right? The the advantage with Nabivolol is it increases nitric oxide synthase. So it increases. Yeah, right. Yeah. So maybe that's also part of you it. Yeah, pumps, right? Yeah. But also yeah. maybe you're recovering better because of a lower heart rate after the gym. Exactly. Because so that's the, the reason the why. The advantage with Nabivolol Boston is that his, he can still get his heart rate as high as it could. Because of the increase in nitric oxide synthase, he can get his heart rate. It, it, Nabivolol will lower your resting heart rate, but allow you to still get max cardio uh, heart, heart rate. So, so, Steve, would it be completely pointless to run Clen while you're on a beta blocker like that? It still works. I've tried it. But, but, but most of the fat loss that you get from Clenbuterol is an elevated heart rate. So you block the beta-1 receptor with Nabivolol and you activate the beta-2. So your heart rate picks up a little bit 
when you're on clenbuterol and abivalol, but you don't get the palpitations and the continuously elevated heart rate, which contributes to most of the fat loss. So they, they kind of cancel each other out, but you'll still get the, the, the improved or the shortened rest periods in between training, right? Because the nobivol reduces the heart rate faster. So now you get, you know, better, better oxygenation, better recovery in between sets, but you still get that CNS support. Leo, that's how, I, that's how I think the carvitolol is because I could still get my heart rate to 125 on the carvitolol. On the antenolol, good luck. I couldn't get over 100. Well, that's because carvitolol agonizes the alpha receptor. It, so it, it, it has mm. it blocks one receptor, agonizes the other receptor. So it'll raise your heart rate slightly. In, in it blocks the beta one and, and it, agonizes it, it the alpha an two? Inverse, it has an inverse relationship with one of the other receptors, if I recall correctly. I've never oh, taken it myself, fine. but there are two beta blockers that have that relationship. Um, carvitolol yeah. and so it's the same as the bivalol, right? It's a, a selective beta Nebivalol blocker the receptor selective. modulator. It's, no, but... <laughs> Nebivalol is just the most selective, so it doesn't touch the alpha as much. If I remember correctly, I may right. be wrong. No, it doesn't touch the alpha. Carvitolol does... agonizes the alpha. Oh, so wow. it has an opposite relationship or inverse agon. It has some kind of opposite relationship. Yeah. These CRT okay. clinics, guys, a lot of these a lot of these CRT clinics, the they, they go with carvitolol all day long on That's the beta blockers. Interesting. Okay, so but we have another. Those guys are not athletes, right? So what I prefer for athletes would be the nebivalol and the telmersartan. But you would need to Why take both out if you want to get Leo brought up a point about telmosartan, which I think it's, he's completely spot on. I mm. thought it was the beta blocker keeping me fat, but I think it was the fucking telmosartan keep me fat. No, right. So I was just going to say that for the off season, it would be the nebivalol and the telmosartan just to reduce your requirement for food. So you don't get into the state of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease simply because all this food is passing through your liver and some of it might get left behind. Well, then but what, then when you're you trying to... For, what would you use for a guy pre-contest? During a cut, you would use you take the nebivalol out and then maybe use the velsartan as a replacement. Okay, so yeah. you wouldn't use any beta blocker while you're dieting. No, because you need the elevated heart rate to yeah, stimulate somebody, fat loss. Somebody like me, I, I need a beta blocker for whatever I, I do because I, of issues. You, yeah. you Cardio. Could use nebivalol. Yeah, you could use nebivalol yeah. because you can still get your heart rate high when you're exercising and it'll still lower your it'll still work for you. It just won't oh, yeah. nebivalol or car or, or carvitolol would probably be my best choice, huh? Probably, yeah. And I, I would continue to use it myself because I have no desire to get absolutely shredded anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe when I'm 40, but at this point, I would just run like a low maintenance dose and whatever fat loss I get or fat gain from it. So be it, you know, it's, it's longevity is a little bit more important at this point. Exactly. Wait, we have a lot of good questions. I guess we're not going to probably get through all of them. We may need to have a part two with Steve at some point, but let's get through the, a couple more because they're really good. So saw, so, saw, so Moff says, is there a way for a fitness model type to maintain high slash normal estrogen levels for the positive health effects, but still be close to photo shoot dry on a daily basis? I don't want to abuse DHT derivatives or diuretics, but I also don't want to compromise training performance by restricting electrolytes every day. So basically he doesn't want to do anything. <laughs> He's like, I want to yeah. I won't do anything, but can I be dry? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and not control drinking. it. He's like, I Stop. won't control estrogen. I won't take a diuretic. I won't uh, affect my electrolytes. But could I be very dry, by the way? <laughs> yeah, just don't oh, drink water. Oh, Kidney oh, stress. <laughs> so, 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 so I just, I didn't want to answer this question exactly, but I wanted to say like about the estrogen and diuretic thing, because I mentioned this before. I think there's another question about it too, but I think that it may be safer if someone's bloated sometimes to instead of controlling estrogen, which estrogen modulates the mineral corticoid receptors that make you retain more salt and stuff, that you take a diuretic low dose like hydrochlorothiazide, which is given often to people with high blood pressure. It is the, the standard mm -hmm. diuretic given to high yeah. blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So it's very commonly given to people. It was given to me by a doctor originally when I was diagnosed with high blood pressure. It's very normal. If you're bloated, if you're not bloated, if you cause yourself to retain less water, you will harm your kidneys directly. So if you're mm -hmm. dehydrated and you take a diuretic, yes, you will harm your kidneys. But if you're not dehydrated, and that's hard to figure out, but if you're not, then maybe take a diuretic would your I mean, I used to take a diuretic when I was on growth hormone. When I was on 15 units of growth hormone, I had to take a diuretic. Otherwise, I can't. Yeah, it's too, too much water, too much water retention. Yeah. That's when I you, didn't do it for long, but. That's when mm -hmm. you really start getting unhealthy, though, man. Like, oh, I'm going to take a bunch of growth hormone, and it, now it causes water, so I'm going to counteract. Yeah, the diuretic. holes with other drugs. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> no, I'm not saying anyone should do it. I would never advise anyone to take growth hormone. I hate growth hormone. But I'm saying if I didn't take it, I would have gotten heart failure. Like, that's why when people take growth hormone, they can't breathe right. That's heart mm -hmm. failure. You see a lot of bodybuilders going, well, when they're talking, that's heart failure. They're in heart yeah, failure right now. Yeah, it's injection for, yeah. injection for so action, of course, when you're very... 
Mike Will should have probably uh, been on a diuretic. Potentially. That, that, that was my right? biggest thought. And by the way, guys, we got a lot of comments on that last video. Like people like, why didn't you bring Milos on to say his own side of the story? Or like people were acting like we sandbagged him. We didn't at all. It was just the guy's story. He thinks that it's from the insulin. The guy's an awesome guy. And his story is still informative for everybody, even if it's not Very from the informative. insulin. Yeah, it was yeah. good. It was great. No, I, I saw the inter your interview this morning and then the one with Nick Trigelli and the one on IG. And it's it's an important uh, message, you know, for people because like the, oh, most of these coaches, they get flooded with clients and they, they, they might not be able to give you the intention you need or because they've always been coaching, they haven't really dived into the fundamental understanding of how yeah. things can affect everybody differently. And then, you know, they might overlook an important aspect, you know, and it's like, yeah, just keep going. I'm, uh, you know, I'm. Well, well, there should uh, be, there should be an element of like, hey, I want you to take insulin, but I want you to know insulin is the most destructive hormone on the face of the earth for your health. So in mm -hmm. hyperinsulinemia is the worst thing for cancers, the worst thing for health. So I just want you to know you're destroying your health, but if you want to do this, do this. That's what, that's all I would think you need to say. It's like, hey, this is insulin. And, and this is growth hormone, and we know these things cause cancers and, and shorten lives. And we know a lot of people have died in the last 30 years since growth hormone was introduced. So just so you know, this could be dangerous. The funny thing is when, when Mike contacted Milos after in the messages, mm -hmm. he's like, hey, dude, this could happen. Milos is like, you don't know anything. I'm the genius of insulin. That's where we were like, dude, that's too much. Like, yeah. you just... You know what I mean? You know, the problem is like when you're a coach you, and the client comes to you, I want to do, uh, you know, I want to go pro and do this show, this and that and place top three. And then you're kind of like juggling their health against the results. And that's something I always have an issue with, but especially with the competitors at the highest level, they want to go all in and then they blame you. They get into a health ramification. But sometimes as a coach, you don't even know what they're doing. You know, you tell them, uh, you know, this protocol and it's quite moderate, but it should be sufficient to get them to that next level. And then they double everything and without I mean, you knowing, you know, you see their blood working like, why the hell is all this off? You can't you try to fix. You can't blame the coach. Yeah, it's, the is, Milos will tell you that insulin is not unhealthy, which is false. It's just false. Oh, if, I hate those if, interviews. If those one papers, mm -hmm. bro, he would just know he's talking rubbish. I, rubbish. Hate, Every, those, I hate those interviews when he's on Generation Iron. Yeah, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. I, I think there's a lot of more dangerous drugs like stimulants in bodybuilding than, mm -hmm. than, than, than insulin. Don't get me wrong. But to say there's no health risks is retarded. It is, but it's, it's what a, everything it's, we do. It's gross you know, negligence. Gross negligence. Yeah. Gross negligence. It's really anyway. Let's move on from this. So Armesh Singh asks a really interesting question. So he says, "At what point does hematocrit percentage on TRT become dangerous? Is there any solid evidence healthy young people having strokes when uh, hematocrit goes to, uh, to above fifty four on TRT? Does eating iron and vitamin C fortified cereals have a huge effect on hematocrit?" Or does consuming a lot of iron from beans affect hematocrit? Then he says his hematocrit went from 47 to 53 on two months of 125 milligrams a week of TRT. And then his doctor canceled his prescription. What is his elevation? He, he was elevated from 47 to No, 53. no, no. Elevation where he lives. Does oh. he live in Colorado? Does he live in but California? The thing, but the thing is, it changed. Uh, he, he sounds, he's Armesh Singh. His last name means lion in Punjabi. So he's probably an Indian. I, I don't know if he's in America, though. But but to comment on this briefly, right? Mm. Of course, it's known that hematocrit being higher in younger people is less dangerous. The main danger that you would get is thrombotic ve veins, hemorrhages, and things like mm. that. The, the thing is, for people like Boston, having a higher hematocrit is very healthy. It will extend his life because one of the mm. problems with having kidney disease is you have less erythropoiesis, yeah, exactly, less creation right. of new blood red blood cells. Hematocrit is a count of your red blood cells. So... Basically, when you take androgens, you increase erythropoiesis, erythropoiesis. You get more red blood cells. For for some people like me, that's very dangerous. So I had slightly high uh, high blood uh, blood pressure. When I first took steroids, I almost got an aneurysm in my head. One day I was at work and I felt an incredible splitting pain in my head, okay. and and that would that could have been an aneurysm. I could have died that day. So it could it could happen to a lot of people. I mean, I would be careful about it. And and, and some yeah. Pain, Iron is needed to produce red blood cells, so you equip the body to produce them, and then the red blood cells contain your iron. And iron is associated with NAFLD, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, all of that stuff. That's why people who are interested in longevity, like myself, we try to be anemic. We try to be slightly well, anemic on so, the board. So there's a bit of a risk there, but it, because if you get yourself into an iron deficient state, your red blood cell production actually goes up because your oxygen carrying capacity of the hemoglobin goes down. So now you get a very high amount of red blood cells and you see that some are small, some are big, 
Not yeah. for me. Not for me. I, no, I maybe reduced, for you, but, I've reduced but, my iron tremendously. I think on androgens, brother, it's a bit different. I yeah, think, on androgens. I think that may be why you yeah. saw that result. Like right, when you're fasting, I've seen, some of your blood biomarkers are different than mine. When I right. when I cut my uh, iron levels way down, my hematocrit was still very low. When so I what's was, your rich cell distribution? How with? low, Leo? How low? Below, like 48, 47 always. Like how, how about your okay. hemoglobin? I don't remember off the top of my head. No, so I got mm-hmm. Go, go ahead. Yeah. So next time, Leo, check your Ritzel distribution with, because what I say, again, this is in steroid users. So they, they restrict, they do a pescatarian diet, like I'm doing, for example, they don't get any iron or they do frequent blood donations where they, their ser- uh, ferritin, serum iron and, and red blood cells, they get uh, discarded, right? So they get into this iron deficient state and then their hemoglobin gets messed up, their mean corpus volume of the uh, red blood cells and the red cell distribution with, which is the size between small and bigger red blood cells, skews completely. And now all the markers are completely off. So you see very low iron, very high red blood cell count, uh, weird hematocrit readings, and then high hem- uh, red cell distribution with, because limiting iron and donating iron through a blood donation, um, it gets you into these weird states I mean, when you're taking erythropoietic compounds there is absolutely well when you're taking them but there's yeah. one of the concerns with taking them is the fact that you're going to have more iron than even the normal people which we know among the right. normal population being being like slightly anemic seems to be protective for nafl right. alzheimer's for cancer for heart disease and for diabetes also yeah. so it's a right. huge research stream there's so much evidence coming out that and that's and, why and there's so many multivitamins without iron in them that's the reason. Yeah. yeah. No, that's the reason, right? So you have a, a drug-free guy that doesn't have this all this erythropoic response, right? Then you have a guy on steroids, which will send that erythropoic response uh, from the steroids, and then you have uh, you know a guy in kidney failure that doesn't get the erythropoic response who actually needs it. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So he would benefit from EPO. Uh, so it's there's so many different scenarios. So for this guy, he says well, he was on TRT. Maybe he lives in Colorado, where or maybe he has sleep apnea. By the way, did you know I'm from Colorado? Interestingly, yeah. Randall, yeah, you I was get, born you in a, yeah. Oh, really? That's fine. Yeah, 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 I'm from. You've Boulder. been all over, huh? Yeah, that's my home state, actually. Yeah, that's where I grew up. But mm-hmm. so, so another thing also is this, right? If you had a guy on androgens, you could just give him to donate blood because that will give away the iron and the red blood cells. Right. So it depends. Not not donate too much blood. So you need to look into a power red donation because again, if you donate blood too often, and you lose all your iron. Then the red blood cells go sky high to compensate. There, there is no, there's a, there's a, there's an amount you can donate regularly and watch it. They do this for people with, um, uh, I forgot the word, but the people that have high, high iron naturally, they do this right. regular donations and they have okay hundred milliliters, two, two, 200 milliliters micro donations. Yeah. They do it like every two or three weeks or something like that. Sometimes yeah. So, so you have to, you really have to look at the total picture of the blood work because just because your hematocrit is high, doesn't mean that everything else is off. Right. And sometimes your hematocrit is in range, but your red blood cells are like seven, you know, a uh, million cells per, per cubic uh, millimeter. I got, a, so, I got a good experiment that's going to happen and that I'll know that I'll know the results that you guys will be interested in. So I'm, right. an, I'm anemic because of my kidney failure. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm on, let's see, 10, I'm on 18,000 I use of, uh, or units, whatever, of EPO a week. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we're going to see with these blood work coming up, how much it brought me up in, if I'm still anemic with all that EPO and it's, this is pharmaceutical stuff straight from the pharmacy that I'm using. So I'm actually curious cause, Oh, I'm also supplementing with an iron supplement as well. So I'm taking iron, um, not just one pill that that's like top rate on Amazon and I'm taking EPO. So I'm curious if I'm still going to be anemic. Boston, by the way, the cardiovascular impacts of dialysis are often um, modulated by hematocrit. Having low hematocrit and low iron makes uh, you more likely to die of a heart attack because you have kidney disease, basically. So it's great to, to I mean, that's why they always give people erythropoietin. Also, I want to mention something interesting. Did you know that Primo Bolan is more erythropoietic than testosterone? Yeah, so, highly. Yeah, interestingly. I didn't, I didn't yeah. know that. Equipoison. Oh, that's a, is also. Yeah, that's oh, the reason why it's yeah, prescribed. It's be good for that. Primo is too, though. Primo is similar yeah. to yeah, interestingly. That's why it's where it's prescribed. And one more comment for Boston. If you're using EPO, but you're also using an ARB, there is some limited evidence out there that ARBs um, reduce hematocrit and hemoglobin in the bloodstream. Yes. Really? Yes. So, yes. so it might not be as effective as you expect. Yeah. So I'm running an ERB and my hematocrit is like 42%. Mm. And I'm at the bottom of the reference range. And I, I, I 
specifically introduced it at the later stage because it was already coming down after coming off well, steroids. An ARB would do it. Probably an ACE inhibitor would do it too, right? I, I haven't researched it. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, but I, I, I've seen the evidence that ARBs are able to keep hematocrit somewhat in check or, you know, in particular clinical settings that ARBs are, you know, reduce hematocrit and hemoglobin concentrations. But it could also be that, you know, because it's a blood pressure medication and maybe you're, you're diffusing... You know, you're, you're limiting, how you said, you're well, diluting more, the concentrations. I'm more worried about my blood pressure anyway, so I'll probably. Right. Yeah. There is studies, though, that say combining an ARB with an ACE inhibitor um, helps bring GFR up. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Right. You have to look at the total picture and what you want, right? So it's. But so I mean, the a... EPO can only help, you know, it's not going to completely negate everything. You got some uh, fish oil and vitamin E in there to prevent uh, coagulation. Fish oil, that's Leo's favorite. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I got some amazing fish oil right now. I got to tell you about it. But anyway, listen, guys, I think it's it's an hour and 45 minutes and Boston got to his point to where that's the end of the call. He always sits there then. No, no, <laughs> the reason why I do this is <laughs> he does my, my battery's low, so I had to plug it in. Oh, but, okay. but really, though, I think that we only went through half the questions. We should have Steve on again and continue. What do you think, Boston? Of course, anytime. Yeah. Sure. Let's anytime. do that. I'll leave them here and we'll continue just where we left off. And okay. Steve, you should do when you when you start getting back on the gear, you should do like a transformation, like pictures. Yeah, that's a, that's the plan. So I'll keep everybody updated on what I look like before uh, and after, and then do the blood work as well. Because uh, you know the problem in the fitness industry is that a lot of guys they do the transformation, but then you don't see what's going on internally. So I do the blood work and the pictures, and then in most cases the pictures that are not like so me. good. That was like me. I would do like crazy steroid transformation, <laughs> but never yeah. do blood work. Yeah, <laughs> so it's uh you know I want to see uh, let people see what you know what goes in internally as well because I've seen so much blood work of the guys that look phenomenal right, but on the inside you're like ooh, mm. it's not so good. So how's yeah. your lifting going, Boston? Are you strong? No, I, but I'm, I've been weak for a while. That's why I think that I've been going. Something's been going on for years because I've been really weak for a while now. But I tell you what, man, for having kidney disease and stuff, if I, as long as I'm not shooting shit with Gucol in it. Or anything that, you know, brings that, like, like uh, Steve was saying, that, that um, response in your body. As long as I'm not shooting anything that inflames me, like, for instance, I took uh, 200 megs of Primo yesterday with 400 megs of test, and I feel great. As long as I'm using gear that's clean and it's not, mm -hmm. you know, inflaming me, I'm fine. The minute I take something with, like, um, that, for instance, that injectable anadrol, bro, that, that thing is poison. And I'll I, tell you, yeah, people that fuck me up. The injectable TNE that's crashed that I have to heat up. And then injectable S23, which is a SARM, which crashed. That Same. I it's black, yeah. right? That S23. It or crashed, S, uh, yeah. yeah, but it looks black, the injectable. Or was that the other one? The other injectable well, uh, it, it, SARM? It was clear. I got it from Mike Arnold's website. And like I said, it's weird, though. Like when you heat these compounds, and they even at a low heat, you heat them up to get to get everything back in solution. And when you do that, the oil changes color. It goes from like clear to like a little tint of yellow. And to me, that's like, oh, that's probably not a good thing. Maybe oxidizing, you know? Yeah. Why uh, did you, did you, do you still have all that stuff in the house or uh, did you uh, make the next step and kind of toss everything? No, I will not toss anything. It's all staring at me. <laughs> Boston. So, so, yeah. so for your own health, you probably need to toss no, it, you know? No, no, I would never throw it away. I would just give it out. I would give it away like candy for free to whoever wanted it. I, I would also never. Also the ones that you already drew from? Huh? Yeah, also why the not? That Dude, I know so many people that would shoot that shit. Boston, really? let me tell you a funny story. When I was using hormones back in Dubai, I, I gave up at one point. I was like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not, I was drinking a lot. I was like, fuck this. I'm not going to lift weights anymore. So I had like a, I had a bag in my room of just Tren and GH. It was, it was at least $5,000 worth of steroids. I swear it was a lot of shit. I bought in a duffel bag. One day I, I was ordering like pizzas every night, drinking beers and ordering pizzas. And I had this delivery guy, he was an Egyptian guy, he was really nice. He came over the first day and I came out like tipsy happy. I was like, hey, I was like, yo, you work out. He's like, yeah, I work out. He takes steroids, he was a big guy. I was like, oh shit, okay. I was like, okay, next time you come, I'll give you something. He said, okay, so he came Tipped him by the, the next time. Mode. I gave him the duffel bag, I was like, hey, have fun. He looked at it. He was like, holy shit. It was all like so much oh gear. God. You didn't want it anymore, huh? I didn't want it. I just gave it to him. Yeah. I was so when I, when I get a bad experience with a particular product, I just toss it. 
So I, I like know to that give I'm it not gonna. Dude, f- I, I give my group. So cringy. You should just mail it to me. I'll yeah, that is cringy. Know, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I can't good, send you products have to give out it of Thailand. Can you do it? Can you do that, Leo? Can you throw shit out like that? No, no. I even my like even recently when I quit last time, I gave away all my stuff to different people. Like <laughs> I, 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 I just give it away to people, man. I, I can't throw it away. I like uh, as long awesome. as I know somebody's using it or somebody's getting use out of it, it makes me happy. <laughs> me too. I, I, yeah, really. I know if it doesn't work for me, I'm not gonna give it to anybody else. But the, no, like mean, like, the insulin that I had, it was like half an opened of uh, a Lantus pen and it just laid there for like eight months because I stopped in October and it's still good. No cloudiness or nothing. And, and I'm like, you know what? I'm getting back into bodybuilding. So like five units of Lantus on, uh, on leg day. I think that's okay. Right, so five units? That shit wouldn't even get me that's fucking... Nothing, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's nothing, yeah. That's nothing, right? But I, I do feel it because I'm such a, you know, hyper-responsive now after stopping the training and slimming down so much. So it does work. You know, it gives me a little bit of extra fullness and it makes the, the last pen that I have last. But I, w- I would toss it. I had like Austrian, I ran an experiment and I got weaker and I flushed everything down the toilet. Oh my. I would toss God. that. Yeah. What's, yeah. What's, the, what's your favorite growth hormone um, brand? Nordichropin. Nordichropin. The 45 IU pens? Uh, 30. That's the one I have from Russia. Wow. Nordichropin is my are, favorite too. Yeah, you like genotropin, right, Boston? There's this guy that I'm getting on the forum, Leo. He's from Europe. He he has everything from the pharmacy in Europe. He's going to be posting soon. You're going to oh, fucking great. love this guy. Oh. Everything you need. For, he's a European pharmacy. That they sell Omnitrope over there for five hundred dollars for thirty units. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. Thirty yeah, units for five hundred dollars. Uh, from Sandoz. That's a little expensive, Sandoz. huh? Yeah, it's a little expensive. It's crazy expensive there. Is it because it's yeah. in Europe that's that expensive? Uh, yeah, because it's not coming from Turkey and shit like that. It's from it's, it's yeah. Omnitrope. From- yeah, I've never so tried much. Omnitrope. Is it is it good? Have you tried Omnitrope? I've tried it. Like real clean. Uh-huh. It's it's quite okay. Yeah, I like the Nordtrope more. Like Genotrope Nordic- gives me gave me a lot of water retention. So yeah, you know, Nordtrope is the yeah. least, right? Right, and you open yeah. the pin of Genotrope and you're like, hmm, it's like visiting the hospital. Yeah, it's, right? it's a, they use that medical grade bacteriostatic water. Yeah. Right, and so and the the, the nordotropins are already pre mixed, so you don't lose out. You know, when you twist, like with genotropin, you start twisting it, right? And then you have to really look at it, and then yeah. you don't <laughs> twist too much, and it just shoots out, and then I, it's I, like twenty dollars on the floor. That's why I cannot stand pharmaceutical grade GH. You spend all this money, and you always lose a couple units because of all the pressure they put in there. Right, so so I like the nordotropin; it works a little bit better. So I uh, I have uh, I allegedly have some supply. <laughs> allegedly. Uh, I, I one last thing I'll say I make I mixed the humatrope yesterday and I don't know if you guys ever know mix the humatrope but it comes with the cartridge and mm-hmm. it comes with the mixing thing and you put it and you put it on and you shoot the water in mm-hmm. so I did that and I pulled out and then all this fucking <laughs> medical grade backwater like hit me in the face <laughs> I was oh like from pressure I was so fucking pissed for the whole day I was like did I just lose solution because <laughs> either two things happen the pressure from the pen of the just the solution shot up. Or it actually the pressure from the syringe that had the growth shot up. So I'm like, oh, I was like, maybe the growth hormone didn't didn't mix yet, and it was just water. Like I was so mad. <laughs> you just triple the dose just in case, you know, <laughs> so you don't you don't lose. Yeah, it's uh, these these pressure valves. Like sometimes you get these peptides, and they're not under vacuum either. And sometimes they are in vacuum, so yeah, you're like, oh, this batch. So you, you just start shooting a, a bacteriostatic water in there and it sucks it all in oh, and the peptide yeah. denatures and you're like, yeah. now I got this cloudy nonsense, you know, yeah, yeah, wasted exactly. that. Uh. I hate that. I hate that. And it's so unexpected sometimes, especially from the underground world. You don't know which one is, has a vacuum and which doesn't. So right. you, it's better to always inject the air. Anyway, guys, I'll let you be tonight. We'll talk soon. Huh? We'll have you back on soon, Steve, so we can continue. For sure. All right, guys. Continue, guys. Take care. Day. 